Alright, you're good to go. I was after, but okay, I'm just gonna well hold on just a moment. See if I can get back to the share. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead without the uh, agenda and just we'll go with it. So go ahead and start. You're good to go. Hey. Well, thank you, everybody. I am um, going to call the council meeting of uh, uh, not, not the council meeting, the finance committee of the council to order at 2.34 p.m. And uh, it is uh, July 9, 2020. And I'd like to welcome everybody present. Governor's order. Uh, this meeting um, can be conducted and is being conducted as a remote meeting uh, and uh, the open meeting law exception um, applies. And uh, with that, I'm going to go through um, of just making yeah, sure. Wendy, that I'm having very bad reception. Is it just me? Are other people having problems? It does seem like your audio is a little bit laggy at the moment. Yeah. Okay. If it continues to be a problem, let me know, but then I'm going to have to uh, move to an unair conditioned part of the house and rejoin the meeting and let Kathy, um, as vice chair, um, continue the meeting for a brief period of time. Are we doing better? Yes. Yes, okay. right now. Yes. Yeah, okay. Let's uh, make sure that we can uh, get through the uh, members of the committee to just confirm your presence and confirm that you can um, hear and be heard. Um, so, Dorothy Pam. Dorothy, unmute and uh, let us know you can be heard. I'm. The visual I get, it looks like she's frozen. Yeah, um, she is. It's a frozen picture. Yeah, I'm getting. Dorothy, unmute, please, and uh, confirm your uh, can be heard. Dorothy Pam. Well, let's come back to Dorothy. Kathy, I know you, you've you already signaled because you've spoken to us. Um, I'm here. Lynn? Here. And um, Pat D'Angelis. Here. And uh, the other two committee members is Sharon Pavanelli. Here. I'm just. Bob Hegner. Here. <clears throat> hey, Dorothy Pam, can you hear us? Yeah. Um, still frozen. So I'm going to declare that we have a majority um, of the council members, which constitutes a quorum present so that we can begin the meeting. And uh, maybe um, Athena can see if she can identify the problems and if there's management that needs to take place in the meantime, um, Lynn will help out with that. But unless I hear objections, um, we do have a quorum present and um, a big agenda, so that uh, I'd like to go forward. And I, um, Sean, do you did you have an, any uh, direction as to which, what order you would like to do it as community services first, or? Yeah, so so we're going to start with um, Julie with um, the health department, and then we'll move to uh, Mary Beth with the senior center and then to Barb for uh, uh, LSSC, Cherry Hill and the pool. Um, and then Paul, if Paul hops on, we can um, do social services and veteran services at the end. Okay, and then, uh, and because the other things we were, we were gonna do is uh, conservation and development. And I saw Chris and Dave. Yeah, they're gonna go after, um, after we finish community services, then we would transition to um, Conservation Development and Rob and Christine and Dave will be here. Yeah. 
Um, and then we'll, we have people come in for general government at the end as well. We've got um, our finance team, the town clerk, and some other. Um, some other. Very good. Okay. Um, do we still don't have Dorothy? No. The reason I feel it badly looks about like Bob's it. trying to help her. Yeah, Dorothy was the lead. Was the person who was going to be the lead for the community services presentation. So I hope that she can get on very quickly. Uh, the uh, but we I think we should just go ahead and start. Nonetheless, Dorothy. Yes. Yes. Okay, so you can I keep be trying better. to find. I don't know if it's me or you, but I'm looking for better reception, so I'm moving around. You're doing better. Okay. This is fine right now. Okay. Yeah, I could hear that. Okay. Okay, um, because you were our, uh, one of the calling you first as we go through the various departments. If you had questions, um, and we were going to start with a um, with public health, and uh, public health is part of. Uh, Community services and uh, is on page 92 of the um, bu budget book. And for any members of the public who are watching, who are not aware of it, the uh, entire uh, proposed budget is available on the town website. Um, go on, when you go under government budget, and then under this year's budget, you'll find the complete budget presentation and uh, it is available to you and as references to pages are in there, they uh, can be found through looking at that document. So um, with that, uh, we'll um, go ahead and see if there's an initial presentation from Julie. Do you have anything you want to report to us to start or Paul, do anything you want to do to introduce public health? Well, I just want to let, you know, we have a lot on the agenda for today. So we'll, I've told our department heads to be very minimal in what their initial presentation is. So um, more lead with what, what your questions are. Uh, I mean, we could spend the entire day with Julie, uh, but uh, <laughs> I think we've got a lot of other people to, here available too. Okay. Uh, Julie, did you have any uh, beginning? Yeah, I have two things. Paul, I know you've just hopped on, so I don't know if you heard Sean's introduction of the agenda. So um, he was just mentioning that social services would go way at the end. And I was just wondering, I believe that's what comes under my budget. So can I do um, my public health and then a brief discussion? Because I believe social services is just resident assistance, correct? Yeah, if you're going to cover that, Julie, um, that's fine. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. It's just I've got a weird time thing going on. Okay, so yes, um, I'm going to be really brief here. Um, I'm excited because when I look through the accomplishments, the challenges, um, I see that um, it's quite up to date um, because this was written a little bit back here, but um, things are... Um, really accurate here. So I could take you through it all, which is what we usually do. I'm not sure if you really want me to do that. Um, so here's what I'll do unless, and you can just stop me if you don't want it. So you can see in the accomplishments, um, we're talking about tobacco, tobacco regulations, marijuana, um, homeless services with Craig's doors, and then COVID-19 with our higher ed partners. Um, so, um, that is all accurate. That's everything that we've been working on. Um, obviously, the marijuana work stopped um, sometime in the early fall. Um, when we get down to challenges, um, all those challenges are um, completely accurate. Again, lack of resources for those experiencing mental illness and substance use disorder. I think as we're looking at what's happening nationally around policing and the discussions we've had from our police department who do an absolutely phenomenal job, um, I think that I would echo what they said in their presentation that we have certainly seen um, 
over the past X number of years, more and more issues around folks experiencing difficulty with mental illness specifically. Um, need for day services for those experiencing homelessness is a regional issue. Um, when I put it in here as a challenge, I don't put it in just as Amherst challenge, but as a regional challenge. Um, the need for substance use, use prevention education. Um, and then as we see, um, planning for the town veterinarian and the public health director to retire. Um, those uh, are certainly things that are, as you all know, I'm retiring September 1st. Um, the town is well into their search for a new health director. Um, and um, we do have to have on our minds the idea of what will change around animal control. Um, and then um, the continuity, continuity of policy leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic. I don't see that so much as a challenge anymore because we've created this incredibly great core team within the town. Um, I will, of course, be one of the people exiting that team, but we'll bring someone on. Um, so long range obje objectives, um, improving the public's health is still just as important as it was as we see the threats to public health now. Improving health services for underserved and high risk populations, again, with this, this umbrella of COVID that's over everything that still is an incredibly important issue. Um, and if we look at the third one, to improve access to healthy food and fitness, well, we're certainly focused on access to healthy food um, because that is has always been and is now, of course, um, a growing problem here and really around the country. Um, if we look at the FY20 objectives, um, I love that my first one is accomplished, which is um, updating the current Board of Health regulations. Uh, the board has been working on this for two years. And um, <laughs> I was hoping by this day we'd be done, but I believe tonight might be the night or else um, our meeting in August when those tobacco regulations will actually be finalized. They really pretty much mirror what's happened at the state level around vaping and all of that. Um, but because of COVID-19, that had been um, kind of uh, delayed for a little bit, but we, that is being accomplished. Um, once again, the recreational marijuana is kind of completed at this point. We had a really robust process around that. Um, and the last one is, again, has been kind of put on hold, which is working with the schools, et cetera, around marijuana and the effects on the developing brain. Um, again, COVID has kind of um, changed what we're focusing on right now. If I look at the FY21 objectives, those have, um, the first two have completely changed. So as we're looking at um, school kids coming back and we're looking about the capacity within our, within our health department and the improved capacities at the schools, they hired a full-time nurse manager um, last January, which has been providential. Um, she has worked closely with the health department. Um, we will no longer be offering immunizations um, because uh, we're just not going to be able to do that as we see um, the anticipation in a spike and the need for focusing on COVID-19. So worked closely with her and she is preparing ahead of time for that. We see that around the state and around the country that kids are or have been behind in their immunizations. Um, so she'll be working locally to make sure that pediatric pra um, practices are really working to get people a medical home and then also to get kids up to date with immunizations. Um, and then the other one, um, it really probably isn't an FY21 objective for us to be working on marijuana, vaping, and tobacco use because um, we're just not going to have the bandwidth for that. And there are some regional entities who are working on that. Um, service levels, I mean, maybe I'll just leave it to you to ask questions about that. Um, And the other thing I'm going to possibly flip back to is if you look at the beginning, the health director is at 0.8 hours and the public health nurse is at 0.8 hours. Um, actually, those two positions right now are full time. 
but they're being partially funded through um, right now some public health funding that came through initially um, from the feds to the states. Um, and then once that funding is used up, we'll be able to use some of the CARES funding, funding to um, pay for the increased hours for those two positions. So I'm thinking I'll leave it at that before we get to um, the social services and see what questions you have. I will start with one because it follows up immediately on what you just reported on at the end of your presentation. Then I'm going to turn it after that over to Dorothy Pam to see if she has any initial questions to ask. Um, just so that uh, everybody knows that the committee this year assigned various members to um, sort of over become our expert on one section and, and to help us write the report on one section. And Dorothy is uh, working on the community services sections. But getting to the staffing question, uh, I what you just noted, of course, was available on the chart on page uh, 892. But then when I was trying to get it to the staffing um, on page 94, um, to make sure that I understood uh, how, what had happened with it in relation to those and what the plans are going forward. Are we keeping both of those positions now at full time? Is that the plan? Yes, you are absolutely going to need those two positions at full time. Um, I would say at least for a year or two as we're looking at this pandemic. And you know, Andy, I'm so sorry. I also realized the other thing that's not included here, and I I should have checked beforehand why, is that we also have a very part-time position now. It's 12 hours a week, which is a program assistant. Um, so that person is um, assisting the health director and the public health nurse with whatever it is we need, responding to the public, research, um, and then doing administrative tasks. And I'm not quite sure why that's in there. I'm sure that Paul and Sonia do. Um, Yeah. That position started in February um, in the old fiscal year. Um, my apologies that I did not see that that was not accounted for. Okay, so that's, uh, what was the position? It's, it's a program assistant and it's 12 hours a week. It's an unbenefited position. It, um, it's called program assistant as opposed to administrative assistant because, oh, Sonia's waving. Sonia? I can answer that. It's because we, we couldn't budget for her in 21 because we're paying out of COVID. So that's why it's not included. Okay, so it's also part of the COVID funds. Okay, I wasn't sure about that. My so, uh, supplant. No supplanting, yep. Um, but it does, it is going to continue for, we have, it can continue for the uh, 21 year. Sonia? As of right now, it can be um, funded from the CARES Act money until the end of December, um, unless something, unless the eligibility changes for CARES money. But we also think that with the change in health director, we'll probably have room in the budget um, to accommodate that the rest of the fiscal year. Okay. And I do want to advocate for the fact that that department really needs that. You know that we went from being a large department to a very small department. There was a moment where we transferred the administrative assistant over to inspection services. That was a full-time position. Um, I had hoped that we would then have a half-time position and somehow that got lost in the sauce so shall we say so even before covid we were desperately needing some kind of assistance um, this was actually talked about for months before the pandemic um, and it just was sort of providential that we had it in place just as the pandemic was hitting so um, this is a very busy department and um, 
Yeah. You know, there's, uh, well, anyway. I, I just want to make sure there's clear clarity. Um, Sean mentioned about the COVID money and how that works. We can't just suddenly start paying people out of COVID money that are normally on our payroll. COVID money is allowed to be for new things. And so this is how we're sort of adjusting things to make it justify it under COVID. Um, and so that's, there's just, you know, Sean's becoming really good at sort of figuring these out. So when we submit the information to the state and the federal government, they reimburse us for the costs. And during FY20, originally what had happened when we got this position was that um, because I was working part time, but that had been decided after the start of the FY20 year, I went to more part time in October, then we were able to, orig the original thought during FY20 was we were moving money around and taking from my my salary basically to pay this 12 hour position. Now I'm remembering. And then the pandemic came along and we actually immediately got some funding. I think maybe Sonia, the PBTC money was in, um, PVPC was in maybe March. And it was actually a check that was like hand delivered. It was like spend it on public health. So we were then able to start spending from that pot of money. Um, Right, but I also want to point out that it still wasn't budgeted in FY20. It was Correct. just things that allowed us to bring it on. Correct. So, it was not budgeted. It was not taken budgeted for it. Right, right. No. But I'm just going back and realizing that because I was saying it happened, the decision was made before the pandemic, and that was because we could take it out of what had been my larger salary. That's all. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll try and make sure that that gets included in the report. Um, that we submit to the council since it was not, um, you know, it requires sort of an amendment to the budget presentation that they have. Um, Dorothy, did you have any initial questions? Um, otherwise, I'll ask Kathy to start since she has her hand up. But Dorothy? I do have some questions and it's about vaccinations. Um, both the old vaccinations and two, the new one that we don't have yet, the COVID vaccination. Um, so my first question is, well, I'm going to go backwards. When we do have a vaccine, will that be, will the health department of Amherst play a role in getting people vaccinated or will there be some other agency that's doing it? So that's question one. Yes. Um, thank you, Dorothy. I can only imagine that local health departments around, uh, along with community health centers, doctor's offices and hospitals will all be involved in that effort. Um, I think that local health departments, including our own, bring a lot of expertise into how to do that because of all the many, many years when we were the main providers of flu vaccines, which I'm sure you remember, back in the day we would do large clinics well, they don't seem so large now, but with like close to 600 elders for flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I absolutely think that we will be part of that. What that will look like is... So, so my, my problem is, first of all, with regular childhood vaccines, we know that there's a, a movement which has been um, encouraging some people to be against them, and that can feed into people being against a COVID vaccine as well. Um, mm -hmm. So when I had kids, I had a Department of Health card for each child, and every vaccination was on that card. And I had a copy, and the public health department had a copy. Yep. I'm getting an idea now that it's not quite that simple. And I think yes. number one is a town thing. We want to have all the school children vaccinated. We want to have all the people, children and seniors, vaccinated for flu vaccines because so, Dr. Fauci is saying that that can be something that might help keep people from getting so sick with the flu. So this is a lot of stuff. And I, Yes. I just like to an idea of how is this being coordinated in Amherst and what the role of the health department is going to be in it. Yes, yes, you ask a very good question. And Dorothy, can I ask you, were you raising your kids in Massachusetts at that time or elsewhere? No, in the New York City area. Okay, because I think this is crucial. So Massachusetts, along with one or two other states, is very different from most of the country. Most of the country has large county health departments with many, many staff, physicians. They do all kinds of well-child visits. They do immunizations. When I was in North Carolina, in fact, my kids got immunized at the local health department. Right. 
So in Massachusetts, what we have is 351 little boards of health. Um, and then in larger towns, we actually have health departments. Um, Amherst is one of the very few um, health departments in Massachusetts that offers immunizations. And we started that partnership with the school um, back in the late 90s when um, Amherst was identified along with um, a couple other communities as having low immunization rates. And at the time they thought it because everybody was crunchy granola and didn't want to vaccinate. That's the, the language that was used. Um, and what happened was um, they took a look at it and they saw that wasn't what it was, that we did not have that many people who took the exemption. So um, what happened at the time is Kaiser Permanente stepped up. They, they had pediatric providers at that time and they, um, in conjunction with us, we were sort of the link between the schools and, and Kaiser, um, created an immunization, an immunization clinic for kids who, uh, the other thing that was happening at that time is hepatitis B vaccines had just come on. Mm -hmm. and Amherst was one of the few towns that didn't have like a hep B um, effort to get those kids immunized. So that was one of the first things I was tasked with as a public health nurse. Mm -hmm. So um, we worked with Kaiser around that and then, uh, she it was only a year or two later that Kaiser left. Mm -hmm. So um, the town, the, the health department at that time took on having this small immunization clinic to work with the schools because what we identified is there were kids who didn't have a medical home um, and couldn't afford their vaccines. Now, of course, over the years, various things have happened, right? We've seen huge Im improvements in access to health insurance, access to mass health. Um, right, right, right. That's so, so that's sort of the history there. Where we are now is the past couple of years, we've been working closely with the schools um, and also with the new community health center that had opened, opened the Musanti Center yeah. to try and do more linkages that way. Because what we really want is for kids to have a medical home, not just a vaccine. So, um, what happened, as you all know, is um, last, gee, it's only last fall, the Missanti Health Center lost its two healthcare providers. So um, I don't know how, where they're at right at this moment, but they were close to hiring providers the last time I talked with them. So once again, um, the Musanti Health Center will hopefully be up and thriving and there will be able to be these linkages between the schools and the health center and other area providers because that's really the direction we were moving in. Mm -hmm. um, so does that answer your question? You're saying that if we do get a vaccine, it'll most likely be organized through the Musanti Center, which is not run by the Amherst Board of Health, but by some other entity. Well, I was talking more about childhood vaccines. When we do get the vaccine for Corona, it is going to take every single entity we've got, local public health, state public health, um, healthcare providers. They're very worried about this around the country. Um, I think in Massachusetts, we have a really good track record around immunizing. Mm -hmm. um, and as I say, I do think local boards of health um, have a great expertise in that. I can imagine regional efforts. For instance, we have a regional public health emergency preparedness coalition. I can imagine us rallying with them, also using volunteer nurses um, and others from what is called the Medical Reserve Corps. Um, so it's going to take a huge community-wide effort. And so mm -hmm. it would be way the, beyond the capacity of our little health department anyway, but we will be a partner in all of that, absolutely. So my, my last question is, if Paul wanted to say, in the town of Amherst, so many people are up to date on their childhood immunizations, so many people have had their flu vaccine, so many people have had the COVID-19 vaccine, how would he get those numbers if everybody's working on it from their own perspectives? That's a great question, Dorothy. Over the past few years, another thing that Massachusetts is really a leader in is something called the MIIS. It's the Massachusetts, blah, Massachusetts Immunization Registry. So okay. this online program, every single vaccine that either our public health nurse gives 
or right. a doctor gives all goes into this system. So all that data is held at the state. The other thing that happens um, for school kids is that the state does um, surveys. Mm -hmm. So that they're collecting all that information for various grades. It's always available on the state website. Okay, um, okay. thank you very much. Thank you're you. welcome. Okay. Uh, Kathy. Um, I want to, one of the questions I had, Julie, actually, you brought up indirectly on the Musanti Health Center. Um, I was looking for a couple things on to what extent we interact with it and use it as supplemental services. Um, particularly, I saw you saying we have a challenge on mental health issues and on medical home issues, and we have this clinic. The second piece of it is uh, I'm assuming the center pays us rent, and I wasn't quite sure where I would find that in the budget book. And if if it's you know a, a source of revenue for the town, um, so it was a question of where where do I even see that we've got this health center? Um, to what extent does it interact with kids? Uh, does it have a mental health a community mental health worker? I'm I'm used to seeing the federal community mental health centers that are different than the community health centers that very much focus on behavioral health. So it's sort of, that was a, a general question on, uh, is that a resource we use or our schools use, even though it's paid by a federal clinic or insurance? And now you've just said we've lost two health care providers. So I guess, do, do we think it has a rosy future or is it a shaky future? Great questions, Kathy. Um, so, I'm going to say that at the end, Paul and Sonia will talk about where does the revenue sit in the budget, because that's not my area of expertise. Um, so when we talk about mental health, um, as the in the planning stages for the Musanti Health Center, mental health was something that was talked about a lot, as was dental health, as two huge needs in this area and in Massachusetts in general. <clears throat> Initially, the health center was going to start just with medical, and what they decided to do was go with medical and dental because the need was so huge. Um, and then what they wanted to do was to make sure they were partnering with other mental health provider entities in Amherst. So in Amherst, we have um, ServiceNet, which has um, mental uh, therapists, but not prescribers. And we also have CSO, um, which is Community Support Options. Community Support Options operates on University Drive at um, a place called The Bridge. Um, so their, their uh, residency here has been more like eight or nine years. Um, <clears throat> they do have therapists there, um, and they do have the possibility as does ServiceNet of linkage to prescribers that are located in Northampton. Um, so when we talk about mental health services, one of the yeah. biggest needs is prescriber. Yeah. Um, so, so that's how they started out. So um, about, so they've been open about 18 months, about 11 or 12 months into it, they actually got grant funding to offer bilingual therapy, which, is, which was also a specific need that was identified in the community. Um, because of the physical space of the health center, um, they actually didn't have a space in there to do it. So it's been a challenge and actually the town has worked with them, um, letting them use some space in the bang center and then they found other places. Um, so some therapy was happening. Um, but again, when I talk about the mental health needs in the community, so many, many of them revolve around folks who don't have access to medication, go off their medication, need support in staying on medication. Um, medical home. So yes, one of the big things that we were so excited about was to be linking all our social services, service agencies and our schools with the Musanti Health Center so that um, a lot of our families who are on mass health could have medical homes. Um, I won't go into some of the complexities around what mass health requires, but um, so they opened um, and then after about 
10 months or something. Ironically, they lost two of their providers for different reasons. Um, and they've been really struggling to get providers because it's hard to get primary care providers. It's hard to get them in Western Mass. It's hard to get them to work at community health centers. So when you ask if it has a rosy future, um, I hope so. And I don't know completely where we're at at this moment, frankly. And no, I know I'm taking you off of town services, but I just thought it's sitting in a publicly yes. owned building so that then we, so we opened it up. Yeah. We did, we, we partnered with them. We, um, we did a lot of talking about the immunization clinic and how there could possibly be, you know, this, so this overlap there, right? Because they immunize, we were immunizing. We're seeing low income families and kids who don't have access to care and how that would all be able to merge together so they had this true medical home. And, and frankly, it just, um, it, it got, it, devolved because of a lack of staffing, which we really hope is going to come back online. Yeah, I can, I can get more on this later, but thank you, that, that answered my question. And okay. you're gonna talk about the social services next, because I did have yep. a question about that. Yeah. Um, let me uh, uh, keep us moving. Lynn has a hand up. Lynn has a hand up, Andy. Yeah, it's I said, Lynn. This is a financial question. And it's really not even a question, Julie. Um, I have to just say to the town manager, I hope that uh, as we look at COVID, we look at ways in which we can add uh, resources and staff to this area over the next two years. I think it's gonna be critical. Um, and I think what we've seen is that Amherst is not only called upon uh, within the town, and regionally, but we actually have become a resource for a lot of people. So as we look at the opportunities with COVID, please look for that opportunity. Okay, Sean? To speak. I just wanted to highlight this. People may already be aware, but the, um, the region got a public health grant last year, which was a $100,000 grant for three years, and then it drops down a little bit. Um, and that grant covers Amherst and it's focused on um, children, but that's another resource that um, hopefully can help as we go forward. When you say the region. The regional school district. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. That um, I did want to, while we're on to uh, you and Sonia for a second, I will point, point out to everybody, uh, including people watching who are uh, attendees publicly, Again, the budget is available online under the, on the town website under government uh, budget. And if you go to that section, you can find the manager's proposed budget. Uh, we're discussing community services at page 91. Um, Kathy, you asked a question about the receipts from the rental and rental and other receipts is actually near the beginning of the budget book under local receipts pages six to seven. So either, Sonia or Sean can direct us to um, where you, uh, the, the rental is found. Um, we're gonna be later talking about conservation and development on page 79. And I wanted to remind everybody that um, as you look at um, LSSC, which we will in a few minutes, um, there's also Appendix C on page 175. And that has a lot of statistics about LSSC programs. Um, so, Sean or Sonia, can you answer Kathy's other question about the rent? Yeah, Sonia, you can go ahead. Okay, so on the rental um, receipts, that's part of local receipts. And uh, we budget about 130000 in total for rental fees. And I believe that the New Santee Health Center is around 25000 a year of that. But it is already I'll, budgeted and accounted for. And I'll just add, um, Sonia, I think we did drop it in the FY21 budget, um, our rental revenues be, um, in anticipation of some of these things. That's right. We adjusted it by a quarter of the year, I believe. Yeah, so we factored in some reduction in rental revenue because of this. Okay, so so that, that's on the rental line, Sean, that, that's yeah, on look page at the, seven. There's yep. a big drop there. I can see it. Yep. Yep, exactly. There's a bunch of other rental revenues as well. So we have a detail sheet that shows the different ones. Okay. Um, yep. 
but all of those um, revenues, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, are just part of the general revenue for the town that are yep. available and included in the amounts to be appropriated as because what we're really ultimately voting is the appropriation and the receipts is part of the revenue that is then available for appropriation. It's not earmarked for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, so the additional questions I had about public health, um, one is, uh, and this may be a question that I'll re-ask, I, I should more appropriately re-ask later in the afternoon when we talk about inspections under conservation and development, but uh, are they doing the restaurant inspections or is your department doing the restaurant inspections? So all the inspectors are located in inspection services. Um, we've got Susan Malone, Ed Smith, and then John Thompson, who is a code enforcement. He's half health, half building. Um, and uh, Ed now is also becoming partially a, trained in being a building inspector. And certainly Rob will speak to this later, but they do the inspections. Yep. And uh, have you, do you have a role in overseeing the restaurant and other health, direct health related part of the inspection? Correct. So, so how it works is that those inspectors are agents of the Board of Health. I'm also an agent of the Board of Health. I'm also kind of the liaison to the Board of Health. So their authority to do those things comes through the Board of Health. And how we've worked this is that when they have difficult issues, whether it's with a restaurant, whether it's with housing, um, then um, those things are brought to my attention and I work with the inspectors on them. So if we have a restaurant that's really not coming into compliance and has a lot of problems, then I work with the inspectors, um, sometimes doing inspections, helping them to prep for board of health meetings, helping them to write orders and, and to make decisions. Um, but they are supervised by the building commissioner in their day-to-day -day work. Okay, I can re-ask the question. Obviously, there have been a lot of changes this year in the way restaurants are operating when they are operating and uh, taking over new spaces and doing things very differently. And uh, so I don't know if you have any comments on that, but I generally, um, I think that also, do you foresee any particular problems um, coming ahead that we should be aware of that um, are as COVID moves into its next stages? Hmm. Um, so I'll take the first part. So um, I think that uh, we have a really fantastic group of inspectors and Rob Moore also has been terrific in helping with all these different things, as have other staff in inspection services in terms of all these changes about how food establishments are working. Um, Myself and the inspectors are on um, two one hour phone calls a week where every time we move into a different phase or the, gov or the governor writes a new order, um, we have the expertise of various folks at the state level. So all of us are receiving that same information at the same time. Um, we're able to ask questions. It's an incredibly great resource. And I feel as I hear how other towns are managing and struggling, I'm really struck by what an incredibly good job Amherst is doing, really under Rob's leadership in inspection services with, with these um, three inspectors who are just great. And, and other inspectors have been helping too with various aspects of all these changes in how um, food establishments operate. And I think that um, I also feel that the uh, bid and chamber of commerce have been really helpful with it and that our um, business owners pretty much one and all are really stepping up to the plate to understand how to do things safely um, and uh, it's it's really been a great collaborative effort here as I hear about in other communities where there's a lot of adversarial things happening between departments and between the community and, and the town I really I feel like um, we're doing a great job here. Um, you, the second part of your question, um, you're saying, what things do I anticipate about COVID? Are you talking about just in terms of our businesses or just in general? 
just in general. It's, uh, and I think that it's, uh, since we're really on budget, whether uh, COVID is going to change the demands in the department that you perceive for 21 and whether there are things that, you know, what, what you're envisioning and whether we have the resources to do what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you for that question. I think that, yeah, what I anticipate is what we are going to see all across Massachusetts, which is there will be a lot of young people coming back to town. They're already arriving. Um, and we so care about them and we so welcome them. And yet our young people are the ones who are um, really most at risk of, of getting sick and then inadvertently spreading this disease. Um, because developmentally, we're asking a lot of them to change behaviors that are just um, really part, part of the core of who they are. And so I anticipate um, there will be a lot more cases of disease. Um, so we'll be doing a lot more contact tracing, quarantining, isolating in partnership with our um, higher ed. And um, when I think about the implications for our department, um, I think that uh, I'm glad that we have that COVID money because what we may want to do is hire um, some extra public health nursing. I think at this point, we're also incredibly lucky because there aren't many public health nurses with backgrounds um, in Massachusetts and in many other states too. Uh, but we have an excellent public health nurse. Um, and so again, what we're doing is kind of redefining what her role is in the department and what she really needs to be focused on. So for now and, and in the future, we I we both feel pretty good about that. We've also got the CTC at the state level. Um, but if I anticipated more needs in the budget specifically for our department, they would go there. Um, I do think that this will affect our other departments too, especially um, EMS and police, um, because we will see um, more folks probably needing transport, becoming ill. Okay, I'm not sure. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Um, so, uh, Dorothy, I see your hand up. I do want to move on because we have to keep an eye on time and get us into the community services um, questions that Kathy had started to ask. But, Dorothy, did you have a last thing on this, on the direct public health that you need to get answered? Yeah, I had a question about um, people in the middle, whether they're being serviced. Um, there's things for children in schools and seniors and veterans and homeless people, but what health benefits are available to low-income people between the ages of 18 and 55? Um, I believe my question about the Well Baby Clinic has been answered. We don't have one. Um, so I just, and I guess some of those people are going to be served uh, in dealing with COVID-19, but um, just a question about that. Yeah, I'm thinking maybe you mean like who interacts with that population because we have senior services, we have the schools. Um, I think that you make a good point in that folks over the age of 18 um, are young adults like 18 to 30 who aren't involved in higher ed are often a population that um, maybe don't have health insurance, don't seek health care. We certainly saw a change in that with Obamacare when, when kids with families who had health insurance could get health insurance up to age 26. I, I can say that over the years, that's made a huge difference. Um, so while we don't specifically do outreach to folks, another thing that used to come out of our department, but then um, was coming out of the Missanti Health Center was linking people to health insurance. So we saw people of all ages um, using that service. Right now that's been suspended at the Missanti Health Center. Um, but that I'm a, I, am believe, I believe will come back. It still continues at Cooley Dickinson Hospital um, because one of the biggest things people need often is, is help navigating 
um, how you get health insurance. So they're actually called health insurance navigators. So the Musanti Center had uh, one full-time one really for Amherst. Um, that will come back. Um, so I hope that answers your question there a little bit. Thank you. Okay. Kathy, did you, you said you had wanted to ask about community services? No, it's it's when we. I think Julie was going to say a word about the social services. It had, it it was a drop, and then it said it ran into legal issues. Um, and I was curious about what those are. So uh, that's in reference to the resident assistance program. So the resident assistance program um, was a line item in the budget of twenty thousand dollars a year that the health department kind of. Um, inherited from the planning department um, a, a couple of years ago. So th the, the this had been voted in at town meeting, hmm, I want to say 11 years ago, maybe a little more. And so this line item was specifically to help folks who were um, about to get their utilities turned off and so we're in utility arrears, and then folks who were getting eviction letters because they were in rental arrears. Um, the other group that it helped was if there were homeless folks who found housing and needed help with funding for those move-in costs, um, or folks who um, were able to find housing somewhere, like with a family member, we would, um, be able to pay for um, like a Greyhound bus to get folks to that family member. Those homeless specific needs for the homeless were much less frequent than meeting those needs were much less frequent than the other um, needs. So um, what happened was um, a couple of years ago, the auditors were taking a look at that and they pointed out to the accounting department that it looked like maybe this wasn't legal, um, that the anti-aid amendment, I think I got that right, Sonia, um, said that this wasn't really legal. Um, so um, we have, well, not we, the money folks have looked at this along with Paul, who's very knowledgeable in this, and essentially um, we shouldn't have been doing that because we're not supposed to do that. Um, there's another layer to this, which is that I also felt that it was kind of problematic that this is also not something that we had expertise in. So to the best of my ability and my staff, we tried to function as social workers, trying to make these very difficult decisions, coming up with policy, some of which had already been created, but then sort of tweaking it so we could figure out how do you do this in a way that's equitable? How do you make sure the requests are, are you know, legitimate? It's, it's been a very um, difficult thing to oversee. And so I talked with Paul at length over time about, well, how could we somehow transition this to another social agency? The problem is it's a very small amount of money. So whenever you talk about doing that, um, you know, it really would be eaten by overhead. Um, so I don't know if Paul or Sonia want to jump in here. Um, this has I'm been going to jump in um, because I've done a lot of work over the years in trying to understand the anti-aid amendment, and uh, it is a complex legal question. But I had several memorandums, and Pat had asked this question of me directly in an email, and I put together several responses um, and for Pat. And what I sent to Pat after today's meeting, I'll share with the rest of the committee because um, it provides the explanation of the anti-aid amendment without us having to spend a lot of time on it here. That's fine. I didn't need time. So as long as I, I just was trying to understand what it had been and why it's gone. And I will read what you've sent. Okay. Yes, uh, Pat was just ahead of you on it. I don't know if you have anything to say, Pat, but uh, if not, I think we should I go just on. Have a question not on the anti-aid amendment, um, so I can wait. But I'm I'm in, interested in understanding. We're talking about eighty thousand dollars 
for uh, so, uh, social justice and racial work here in Amherst. And uh, where is that? But where is that going in the budget? What it says is uh, it be placed in the appropriate budget. And when are we going to talk about it? Um, Paul, do you want to respond on that? Yeah. So I'll. I'll so when to talk about it? It's um, once we get moved forward. I think after the budget, we what I want to do is make sure there's called out and that we have that money set aside. Sonia has put that aside in a control account, so it's there, but it doesn't show up in anybody's line item. I didn't want it to show up in the police or community services because I don't think it was really uh, my place or I think it's a community effort about how we want to allocate those funds. And I think it's a broader conversation about listening to people where those money, where that money should be go. Um, can I just say that there are people who uh, who said they would be attending and who are want to have impact in that so um, in those decisions and how it's going to be administered etc uh, and I will forward some of that information to you and for people who are in the public we will be doing public comment later in the meeting um, we'll see when the time works to do it but I will uh, I recognize public comment welcome public comment uh, at a later point in the meeting. Um, Sean, did you have something? Yeah, it's probably worth noting while we're talking about rental assistance that the um, Affordable Housing Trust does ha is setting up that program. Um, I think it's 200 or $250,000 of, of rental assistance um, related to COVID-19 um, stuff. And, and that, that part of that money is being uh, offset by the CARES money. We um, got approval to use the CARES money to cover 200,000 of it. Okay, thank you. I see one hand up from George Ryan, counselor, uh, and uh, they asked George uh, to speak to his question and then maybe we need to move on to uh, the senior services budget. George? Actually, just to request, Andy, if it's possible, could you share that anti-aid memo that you mentioned earlier with uh, a member who's not, with a counselor who's not a member of the committee? Uh, sure. I would, yeah. I would like to see that if possible. Maybe all the counselors would, but uh, just a request. Okay, I will uh, duly noted. Thank you. Uh, so anything, if there's nothing else, Julie, uh, we're very, I'm personally very sorry that you're retiring and I'm very happy for you that you're able to uh, do other things that you've been dreaming of doing. You've just been wonderful to work with over a long period of time and I uh, wish you all and we'll miss you. Thank you, Andy. It's very bittersweet, gotta say. So, and now we can turn to somebody who's relatively new to town, Mary Beth. Uh, any introductory comments about the senior services budget? Uh, you need to unmute your mic if you're gonna. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Welcome. Thank you so much. So thank you. And I would like to begin actually with a thank you to all of you. Um, and thank you for the wisdom and the providence of earmarking some capital funds for the Senior Center, which we were able to operationalize this past spring. Uh, the, I think we closed on a Friday and Monday, Paul emailed me to say we're gonna aggressively uh, you know, go forward with that schedule for remodeling the Senior Center. And though I have a fake background behind me, if uh, anybody wants to have a virtual tour, Rob Mora um, has done a brilliant job under the most trying circumstances of, of really reinventing this place. So though our footprint is small, what we have here is now ADA compliant and fortuitously all of those uh, changes that he made are going to help us to facilitate when we can have people back in here providing more space, there's less clutter and, and really making social distancing uh, more possible. So I just want to thank you because uh, particularly the timing of that, at the same time that the whole world was going around and saying that older adults really didn't matter and the value of their lives was diminished in terms of prioritizing access to medical care and life-saving measures, uh, the investment by the town to say you matter and we value, I thought was a wonderful statement of values um, and, and I think was, 
yeah, it was very meaningful to many seniors when they learned about this going on. So I just, I just want to thank you for that investment and the way that it spoke to the value and how you value uh, the community of older adults. So with that said, um, you know, it, it's, it is interesting to read this. It, it feels like this was such a long time ago um, in terms of accomplishments and even challenges. And I think I would revise this in part if it was written today. But in terms of, of accomplishments, the one that I think would highlight the shift of, of my position is that when I was hired uh, by Paul, he had a vision of it becoming uh, the senior services director rather than a senior center. And um, he really uh, has urged me to go beyond just providing programming at one location and look more globally and in a macro way at what the needs were within our senior community. And one that came to light very quickly when I arrived here was that our seniors, though they would be uh, eligible for home health aides or home care workers, we were not able to access it. And that was uh, an anomaly that was just germane to Amherst. So somebody would be referred to Highland Valley Elder Services. They would be deemed eligible to have somebody come in and provide medical care and or household help. And for anywhere from six months to 12 months, they would not be able to receive those services. So really leaving people uh, in our community in a significant lurch. So I reached out to Highland Valley Elder Services. I worked with an attorney there and we uh, were able to sort of identify some of the barriers to accessing that kind of uh, worker and that employment. And we were able to recruit a provider who located, oh, it's motion censored here. Um, we were able to recruit a home health aid provider that they subcontract with. They located here in Amherst and then uh, COVID came. So they have not fully uh, staffed up to measure, but, but that's just one example of how I, I think um, the definition of this job and the expansiveness of looking at senior services makes a difference for the community as opposed to just running programs within one location. So I, I think that that was a, was a great um, accomplishment for our community and hopefully for our residents to be able to receive those services. Um, structurally, when I arrived in the way that the senior center functioned, um, there was a lot of room for improvement around uh, information management, uh, volunteer orientation. When we think of the staff, though, the organizational chart at the top lists uh, six individuals. We, I really think of that plus 179 because I have 179 volunteers who help us to execute what we need to do. And making sure that everybody understands the values, the mission, and, and how we should make people feel welcome and included um, was a, a new uh, task for the senior center. So we did, we did make some headway. We started uh, an orientation of various subcategories of volunteers coming together with themes, missions, important values that we wanted to exude, and primarily focused around compassion and welcoming. Um, we also, with, within my own staff, we participated along with Julie and a few other town employees with implicit bias training that uh, was conducted through the Chamber of Commerce, which was very helpful as a lead for our community um, and also having them model it consistently for our 179 volunteers. And then the third accomplishment that I would highlight for you is the grant funding. Uh, from the time that I've been here, I've been able to obtain $40,000 in grants. And within the senior world, I think that there are there tend to be small amounts, but any grant that I can pursue, I have gone headlong. And they have covered a wide range of um, opportunities for our seniors, everything from our support groups that we are now providing virtually for bereavement and caregivers um, to various programming around resilience, which we've been able to capitalize and turn into a long term program that um, Highland Valley is now um, going to grant fund and continue that. So I've um, collaborated and partnered with the University of Massachusetts, their psychological services. Um, and what uh, they participated in is a six week program called, uh, it was called Live Your Best Life. And it was primarily focused on resilience and looking at six different domains of resilience, everything from spirituality to mental health, um, to your physical health and movement. And through that collaboration, 
um, the seniors really enjoyed uh, one particular presenter, Dr. Bruna Martins Klein. And so she now runs a twice monthly group that is just beginning around resilience and mental health. So those, those are the accomplishments that I would highlight for you. In terms of challenges, I think I, under challenges, I, I would just, uh, I would primarily list COVID. I mean, it, as you are well aware, um, whether we reopen to the public and when that occurs, I think is um, a discussion underway. Um, I think much like the rest of the town, uh, we are relying on the science and taking a cautious long view towards that. I will tell you that within the temperature of the community that I speak with every day, um, there is not a large outcry for us to open hastily or prematurely. I think there's a concern about what the fall will bring. Um, I participated and served on the state committee for the Massachusetts Council on Aging, where we uh, crafted guidelines for reopening for all senior centers. And it covered a variety of topics from transportation to programming um, to offsite programs and what those considerations should be. And I, I can just speak to that within uh, the senior center proper here. Our footprint is large and that will, I, I think, certainly limit us and also um, in terms of use of the bang center and what that what that may or may not allow. So at this time, um, I always try to disabuse people of the notion that we are closed because we have never closed. I've been here every single day um, since March 12th when, when we uh, no longer allow the public in, but we provided services throughout. And uh, a unique feature that I think um, that I would want to share with you is that in many ways, uh, the closing of the center has allowed us to augment services. And I'll give you two examples uh, quickly is when we are looking at service levels for um, congregate meals. So we typically would have six to 12 people come meal. It's free and it's open to everybody. When we closed down, we were able to shift to a grab and grow, go meal. So it's basically a hot meal, that, um, but it's served cold and people could reheat at home. And I now have anywhere uh, between 25 to 44 people accessing that program. So we've been able to actually um, feed and provide nutritional support to more people by not having the center be open. And then likewise with some of our classes, again, we are limited by the footprint of a classroom, which for some of our exercise classes, which is really an important part, both of mental health and also physical health, those classes will be limited in size, uh, anywhere between 12 to 18 people. Now my online exercise classes, I have 50 people attending. So in some ways, the closing uh, due to COVID has actually allowed us to access and serve some, some additional people. And the way that I've been able to lean into that is, um, I have to say, it's been, uh, for me, the, the best part of, of this experience with the center close is I have been out in the community consistently, uh, whether it's delivering meals, whether it's delivering boxes of food, whether it has been delivering masks, and it's given me much uh, greater contact with various communities across just about every corner of Amherst. And I think that that will hopefully be able to be something that we can build on in terms of relationship and trust and being able to more broadly serve a more diverse community. Um, when we look at um, the challenges, um, I think that the, the, the two that I would highlight would be the a transportation program. So as you may well know, or perhaps not, we do have a bus that sits unused. So it's a 22 passenger bus. The dilemma with uh, providing uh, that bus and, and having it operationalized is first, there was no funding for it. And second of all, because it is a 22 passenger, it goes beyond a, a regular license being able to drive that vehicle. So you need a CDL license. Um, and so we have not been able to secure, or I have not been able to, I should say, within this last uh, 10, 11 months, uh, a, um, a stream of revenue or a grant yet that will fund that uh, van being able to be um, run on a consistent basis. So I know previously it had been in, in place, um, but it was not, uh, when I arrived, it hadn't been functioning. And I see, uh, do I have Lynn with her hand up? Yeah, I actually have several people who have questions and we probably shouldn't uh, yeah. move it along. Uh, 
Great. But uh, I'm glad you reported on the bus. I had forgotten that we have it, and that's just good to know. Mm -hmm. And um, i start with you, and then uh, Pat, and then Dorothy. Great. Uh, so, Andy, given the importance of these various services, what I have to absolutely recognize is we've tried, we put too much into one meeting. And so um, I'm going to really suggest that we not even try to do general government today so we don't tie up everybody uh, for that. The general and government that was on today, general government, it was next week. The other one that was going to be was um, conservation and development, which includes inspections. And that's the other piece that we have today, which is why okay. I need to uh, get us moving a little bit on time. OK, all right. Andy, can I just chime in? Um, general government was scheduled for today. No, um, it was. Today's oh. meeting got busy because we, we moved community services back. Originally, it was going to be general government and, mm -hmm. um, and conservation development. Um, and we have a number of people that joined on for general government. So we just if we're going to move it, we should let them know so they can um, sign off. Um, we, why don't you can for with Sonia for a couple of minutes and then get back and make a recommendation as to what you think we should do. And um, signal to me as soon as you have an answer. We have an answer. Um, so I, th I think it, we should let the department heads who are in general government leave and reschedule them for Tuesday. Um, and if you want to cover general government, Sonia and Sean and I can be here and answer most of the questions that would normally be asked at that moment. Okay, that's that's fine. And uh, but if there's anybody who can join us on uh, when we reschedule, that that's fun, good too. Yeah, and and remember, we moved community services here because public safety. We had wanted to have an entire meeting for public safety, and that's why we moved community services. And then that's why this meeting got jammed up. Um, so we'll move general government to next week. Um, and Andy and Athena and I are going to meet tomorrow, probably around 11, to just see if we need to schedule additional finance committee meetings. Okay. Okay. So I'm um, going to questions. I had said Pat and Dorothy and then Kathy's raised her hand. So let's go in that order. Pat? Quick question. First, uh, Mary Beth, I want to thank you for your work. Um, mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Um, I've been a volunteer for the last several years at the Survival Center, and I do know that there are several, many homeless people who qualify for elder services. Um, and I'm trying to understand, uh, in general, whether uh, ho our homeless population, our homeless residents, um, participate in the grab-and-go meals, and uh, whether or not, since you are in the building, is there any way to open a room at the senior center uh, to be a cooling spot during mm -hmm. this incredibly intense weather. Yeah, um, it, I'll, I'll go from the top of the question on down. So I would, I would let you know that um, within the Banks Community Center property, um, we frequently have individuals who are experiencing homeless who are also seniors. So our grab and go lunch is available for any individual age 60 and above, and that's it. All I need is a name and then any kind of address within Amherst. And we frequently uh, do um, feed um, and also provide meals to individuals who are homeless, who fall within our service requirements. Um, and, I, and I will say, I also meet with Kevin uh, Noonan on Wednesdays. I go up to the Unitarian Church in the morning. They do the breakfast there still. And we go back and forth. We, we talk about in individual cases and case management, things that I could maybe bring to the table or things that he can bring to the table. So we, we have that collaborative conversation. I can't say that that necessarily happens with the survival center as much. I think that it's part due to uh, their distance, you know, that they are not in closer proximity. And I think that people tend to that head there um, you know, are, are just headed for a different direction than, than those who live here in the downtown area or who frequent that downtown area. And I, and I would also say that um, the survival center has, has greater barriers to confidentiality and what they can share. So even the programs that we have participated with them around delivering food have been 
uh, challenging to execute on our end because they won't share informa client information without a release and, and, th and that release process can get uh, challenging. But so the answer is yes as to, as to anybody who, as long as you're age 60, come on by. Uh, the second part of the question in terms of the building being used or accessed, I would defer to Paul because I don't have the executive authority to determine the opening or not of, of the buildings. I had made an inquiry, I think about a month ago, just of my own staff about does Amherst have a cooling center? And I don't, I don't believe that we do have, have sites that are, are cooling centers. So I think that that would be something that I would look to the town um, to, to give me direction on. But I'm happy to do whatever would be appropriate. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Paul, can you respond to that? Absolutely, sure. So we, um, again, we talked about it actually this morning with our core team and again, taking our lead with, with uh, Julie Fetterman who feels like bringing people into a building is not what she recommends at this point in time. Um, so we are creating an environment where we have cooling fans and uh, an environment with bathrooms and other and electricity uh, and shelter. Uh, that would be temporary shelter, i.e. a tent and a location um, that would help um, people get out of the heat, which we know is coming. Uh, so that's where we are at this moment in time. Okay, uh, Dorothy, I said you'd be next. Uh... Yes, so um, Mary Beth, um, I think you're doing a great job. Um, a number of years ago, I was a director of a senior center for several years. And what I know is the most important thing is not the meals, is not the exercise, is not the transportation, but it's the socialization mm -hmm. um, over meals or activities that, you know, just talking. So um, I want to ask about whether you're interfacing with Amherst neighbors. Um, I began getting emails from them and out of curiosity, I signed up and did a three meeting session with them. And um, I, just on the basis of that, you may know a lot more about it than I do. I think that that, that is, it was provided a very incredibly needed service because it was managed conversations with timing, spacing, breathtaking, but people had a chance to talk with each other on a set topic. And many of the people that were on the ones I were could not socialize, had you know some Im immune problem, were absolutely stuck in their houses for, well, forever it seems at this point. So I just wanted to ask you, are you using that program and cooperating with them? Because I think it's something like that is essential. Yes, so I, I communicate with them as recently as this morning. Um, what we're trying to do is to construct, and it, and it is on my uh, service plan, I think it's the very last bullet on page 100 is how it appears for me, is really coming up with a continuum of services. So, so much like the health department, we are a small and mighty staff, um, and we know that we can't meet all senior needs uh, alone. And so we need to have these, you know, community partners who can fill in the gaps. And we have, uh, Liz Welsh and I have been in discussion around programming. What am I doing? What is she doing? So for instance, I'm doing a, a program coming up around healthcare proxies because that is my uh, expertise. She's going to take that, that conversation and deepen it with, you know, palliative care and the conversations that proceed around end of life and conversation, this called the conversation project, et cetera. So we are trying to map out um, similar uh, programming and um, I guess you know, leaning into both of our strengths. So what are we good at and what are the conversations that they can hold? So yes, and, and we, are, we are in frequent conversations. She sends us, um, uh, volunteers, drivers, people who can assist us. So we go back and forth. And, and likewise, individuals who contact us who are looking for additional opportunities, I always suggest and we provide them the information about Amherst Neighbors, which at this time is free, but may not be the case, you know, a year or so down the line. And, and you know, I always make it clear that for now, it's, there is no, um, there's no free, but she does anticipate that that will happen. But one thing that I would know about that is, that, that in many ways, um, and we are doing the same thing with programming online, is that the technological divide is significant uh, for senior citizens. And so I am loathsome to put all my eggs in a Zoom basket um, because it, it isn't equal um, and it doesn't serve everybody. And even um, if somebody can phone in 
um, it, it can be a very disparate experience for somebody um, as people are able to see each other or, or there's a screen share and somebody can't see it. So I, I will say that one of my um, more of my FY21 objectives, which wasn't able to, to make it onto here because it was, it's post COVID, is really looking at technological grants. And I have been pursuing that um, quite aggressively in the last several weeks, trying to find a fund. I would love you know, to find some way to get 50 to 60 laptops or even tablets for a couple of hundred dollars and be able to uh, provide them to community members. Because just as we spoke about the importance of technology for students, um, the same thing, um, older adults' lives are shifting dramatically to online and will be for the, for the foreseeable future. And that includes healthcare, that includes connecting to their families. You know, I, I, um, we do have two individuals who volunteer and provide assistance for technology to seniors. I've had an individual and she was 95 years old and, and she was Zooming into meetings and connecting with her family and her great grandchildren. And then her iPad um, went out. And, and just hearing about what that experience was to not have that, I think really highlights to me. And you know, we still have members of our community. I know that Amherst often thinks itself as a very well-educated community. And I would add, we serve people who are illiterate, that we have to read their mail to them and we have to help them pay their bills. We serve individuals who still write me letters seeking service because they don't even have a phone. So the the disparity and of access to technology for seniors, which is critical to their mental health, their spiritual health, and their physical health, is really an important uh, problem for me to resolve and to find some way, whether it's a research grant or otherwise. So I hope that answers you. It, it does. And I, I just hoping, I mean, other topics, when you're talking about your resiliency seminar, um, the Emerson Neighbors conversation that we had were very positive, although I am interested in the two topics you mentioned, all right? But they were also about what are you learning about yourself? What talents in yourself um, have helped you get through this? Um, so that was kind of like positive conversations. So mm -hmm. I think that it's a great goal. I think it's really, really needed. I have friends who are in that tech, who have no technology, brilliant people who are absolutely shut into their homes right now. So mm -hmm. I seriously, any way that, 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 that I can help to help make that happen, to get technology into the hands of people and to teach them how to use it. It's just so essential. So thank you for thinking that way. Thank you. Dorothy, I'm going to move it on to Kathy because we're going to really getting behind on time. Okay, so I'll be really quick because I was going to build on Amherst Neighbors, but um, Mary Beth, hearing what you're looking for, um, I will, I'm going to go out and help look for what, kind, what kinds of entities. I know a lot of foundations. Um, that do focus on seniors um, and the connection with seniors and mental health and seniors and staying connected. And as, uh, for people who don't know Amherst Neighbors, I mean, they are in the Zoom world now because they have to be in the Zoom world now. But the mm -hmm. notion was being in people's homes and connecting people. So I, I was just wondering on some of the other services, I see the SHINE program gets a lot of... Um, um, it actually gets more visits than people. So it looks to me like you get repeat people coming back. Um, and so have you been able to convert those? And I'm partially asking because I am a person who knows Medicare really well. And the number of friends as they've turned 65 that I've helped figure out, what do I do now? Um, so I can see you know, that people would be coming in. So could, have those been converted so people can still have that hands-on help? Absolutely. Uh, I have one social worker who at this point in time is nearly working full-time doing SHINE counseling. Uh, she just recertified yesterday. Uh, her adaptive capacity to do that same work online the day that we closed, we had anticipated that, um, has been seamless. And she, like I said, she probably is, is working nearly full time when I reviewed it with her yesterday about how many hours she's spending doing Shine Counseling. The one thing I would note about that is what we are seeing is increasingly high numbers of individuals who are 65 who are de deciding to suddenly retire and not return to the workforce. So that's why that there is a heightened need around that. I think that COVID has prompted people 
to reset uh, their thoughts about retirement and when they're retiring. So yes, we are providing that. Also our Shine counselors who are volunteers are doing it part-time on a limited basis virtually, but we have not found it to be problematic to continue that uh, in that way, that service that way. Thank you. Anything else? I don't see any other hands at this point. If members of the committee have additional questions, um, as we have been doing, we will submit them follow-ups by email. But um, Mary Beth, thank you very much. It's been very informative and very helpful. Thank you. Do we need a brief break, or should we go on to uh, can we go on to community serve uh, to um, LSSC first, so that Barb Bills can uh, Barb, why don't you go ahead? Okay, I'll go ahead. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here today. And um, I'm going to, I'm, I agree with Mary Beth, you know, it seems a very long time ago that we wrote these challenges up and um, our accomplishments. But I think I first have to commend my staff in the way that they have kind of risen to the occasion, um, evolved, how they have volunteered to help with other departments and um, really, it's looking, they've looked at the bigger picture, not just our department moving forward and uh, just, just keeping and the ways that they are keeping our youth engaged and, uh, and our adults as well. Um, our, we aren't able to offer obviously as many programs as we had in the past, but certainly what we are offering are very well received and very well attended. So we do have, for instance, we have the tennis, uh, we have a small tennis program, a track program, golf lessons for children. Uh, we have for adults, we're doing yoga and Qigong. And um, then we are continuing and then expanding our outreach program, which I think is incredibly necessary during um, this time. So we're doing a camp in a bag program where we'll be going out to the different um, housing areas in town, as well as Groff Park and Puffers Pond to deliver those programs to youth, which is, um, I think, again, very, very much needed. Uh, that said, um, we have just completed our strategic planning process and should have the draft uh, report in hand by Friday tomorrow. So that's exciting. So that is um, definitely a major accomplishment. And we will have now a roadmap going forward with um, our goals and objectives uh, as to what we want to accomplish over the next three to five years. So that is happening. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I think you know, in terms of other accomplishments, um, talked about the housing area, it was a strategic plan. Uh, Groff Park, thank you to everyone who came out to the ribbon cutting ceremony and I'm so happy to see that project moving forward. And that was, again, a townwide effort that um, is just gonna be, that is just gonna be an incredible resource to the community and to especially um, the children of South Amherst in particular. So, um, I think I'll stop there because I do have three areas to report on. I will say finally though that uh, they're in the staff organizational chart. There is a change there that you should be aware of. The, we have eliminated uh, this year for FY21, um, the, um, it was a full-time equivalent uh, program director position. And that position oversaw the after school program, day camps, and the aquatics program. So that position has been eliminated and I will be assuming those responsibilities um, going forward. So I'll stop there and open up for questions and then I'll move into pools and to Cherry Hill. That's okay. Okay, so, um, any questions about the general LSSC budget holding then pools and uh, Cherry Hill aside? Kathy. Um, yeah, Barb, this last point where you're going to uh, expand your scope so you will do <laughs> this, this other person's job, um, I could certainly see if we look into FY21 where a lot of the activities are, have been muted, you know, in terms of the number of camps we're running. Is this a long-term plan that in, and I'm equally worried about the budget for FY22, so I'm not urging you to say I need another person a year from now. But is it feasible for you to be 
doing it if we if we succeed in opening up a more robust after school program day camps can you be doing both functions that's my question i think it's sustainable for this year again because of the you know we are have been very um you know cognizant and up to date with all the different regulations that have come down and they have limited the size and the scope of the number of of participants that we can have in these programs. So they're they're going to be smaller going forward. We don't know as of yet what the after school program will look like. Um, it is a licensure year, but luckily we've been working hard on that ahead of time and gotten kind of ahead of the curve, if you will, in terms of meeting most of the requirements that are necessary to get that licensure license for the um, after school program through um, the early education and child um, care uh, department of the state. So yeah, no, it's, it's going to be a challenge, but we, we'll do it. I mean, I think it, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that things will look different in FY22 and that we'll be able to fill that position. Thank you. Uh, Pat. Yeah, um, just a quick question. I know that you provide subsidies for families for many of the activities. Um, and events and the pool, et cetera. I'm interested in, in finding out what, um, what impact would have in make, making, ha would have uh, making those programs uh, free and available to any resident uh, without cost or how can we reduce the cost to make sure that people who need help um, to accessing these programs get it. I know that we have a certain number of um, support that goes to social service agencies, but I wonder how we can increase that, I guess. Yeah. Or if we can. Yeah, all of the outreach programs, there's no charge for. So all that is funded by that, um, <clears throat> by that, uh, that uh, line item, if you will. The, the other thing is we have been really doing quite a, a bit of outreach with the survival center, for instance, to provide them with free passes to the swimming pool, which they have ample supply of and um, whenever they need it, we help them there. Uh, so the pools memberships and so forth, we've been encouraging families to use that fund to use the, um, the fee subsidy money so that so that they can um, Partic you know, participate at the pool and in all of our recreation programs. But we are trying to do as much, especially the things that we are doing online, those, there hasn't been a charge at all. And uh, we have quite a robust um, online presence. We have our own YouTube channel now where we provide activities. So uh, all of that is there and it's an incredible resource for the community. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Other questions about LSSC general before we move on to pools and uh, Cherry Hill. Uh, one real quick, don't give a long answer, please, on this, but uh, the uh, cancellation of the 4th of July event, which was uh, unfortunate but necessary, had we incurred expenses um, for that, that we then were unable to recover? How did, how is uh, uh, No, we, the, uh, the fireworks company, Atlas Pyrotechnics, um, they were very generous. They basically took our deposit and moved it to the next year. So we incurred no uh, expenses at all. Thank you. Anything else? Otherwise we'll go on to, sw to swimming. We can do try and do swimming in Cherry Hill sort of together as our two special funded programs um, and get questions on both. But uh, anything you want to introduce us to on both of those? Sure. Well, I can tell you what's maybe it would be helpful to tell you what is happening at the swimming pools right now. Um, so we do have our lifeguards on duty. We're offering lap swimming as well as open swim for families. And that they both have been pretty popular. You know, our weather hasn't been cooperating the way we like it because we've had a lot of thunderstorms, this, especially the first week we opened. But when the weather is warm like today, we, we've had some good crowds and it seems to be going very smoothly. And again, um, we have all the protocols in place 
um, that have been set forth for the phase two opening of the swimming pools. So we are following those to the letter and um, we were getting very good cooperation from the patrons and, and community. So we appreciate that. Um, let's see. So the only, you know, of course we're not off where we are unable to offer swim lessons, which, you know, it is, it's unfortunate, but um, that is out of our control. So hopefully um, by next year, we'll have that up and running again. And of course you shut down the winter uh, lessons too that you had been offering. We did have to shut down those exactly in March. So that was the end of those. Um, we don't yet know what the, um, <clears throat> how the schools, how that is going to look yet. We haven't heard if we'll be allowed in to provide um, lap swimming or open swim. And um, right now uh, in, the, in the guidelines, that's a phase four swim lesson lessons are quite out there. So because of the close contact um, with the children. Okay. So any, any introductory statement about the golf course? If not, I have three counselors sure. with their hands up, so I'll call them that. Um, introductory, yes, golf course is up and right. was one of the first, ironically, um, uh, recreational areas to open. And in terms of providing programming opportunities for the community, uh, well received. We have been extremely busy. Uh, some good participation rates. Um, People seem very pleased. Again, all the protocols have been put in place as mandated by the state, and it seems to be running very smoothly, effectively, and uh, and people are, are enjoying that asset. So that's the latest and greatest on the golf course. Good. Um, so the order that I saw hands go up was Kathy Patton and Dorothy. So Kathy. Um, I think my questions are mainly on the golf course. So um, have, um, when I look at service levels, we the uh, budget book just gets through FY29, but um, so we didn't see FY20. Did we get an increase in the number of either people who use it on a day basis or season passes when Hickory Ridge closed it, when other golf courses closed down? That was a general question and, it may be too soon to say how are we doing for FY21. And then I just had a, I went to the back to try to see where the revenue is for the golf course, but I didn't see it. So I'm sure I just missed a line. So I just was, um, we, you've done a really nice job, FY21, of figuring out a way to operate it for 22% fewer dollars. Um, so I didn't know how we're doing on revenues versus expenses. That's the second right. question. And then the third is you talk um, in, in, in the goals for the DOF course said, said trying to think of creative ways to use it year round, you know, in, and use it for multi purposes, um, not just for golf. Uh, there was a very quick uh, proposal that didn't go anywhere from a resident to look at the clubhouse and you know you because you came in with him on could the clubhouse be winterized um could the pro shop be removed and think of it as an after hours place that you could um eat have music in the winter come in and have cocoa and when i describe that to people people love the idea you know in terms of more frequent use in the winter so that's sort of a thinking year round what what ideas are in the work. And then the final question is on where Pat was going on subsidies. Um, do we do anything? I don't think of golf as a long-term sport for people who don't have money because golf courses are expensive, but it's a great outdoor activity. And it's the reason the course is opened up early because you can, you can socially distance. So groups like the Boys and Girls Club, getting kids out to whack a ball around if you had free kids golf clubs if we could find some resources that don't just donated the clubs um for little kids to just go out it's good hand-eye coordination so trying to think of innovative ways of reaching out to kids and making it either completely free or so cheap that families would say for a dollar i can do this um so those were three year-round revenues um or four, I probably had four points on golf. 
Well, that, I also heard staffing. So let me explain to you why we uh, are staffing, um, our budget for staffing is so much lower. Um, right now we're using our full-time personnel, um, benefit personnel to staff Cherry Hill. So that's why we're, so we're using, uh, we have a, a small amount of part-time seasonals, you know, like our mechanic, uh, there may be another groundskeeper that will come on in a month or so just to help out when things start to get crazy um, in, the, in our growing season. Um, <clears throat> and then to cover, we'll have in the clubhouse folks to cover if people are, are sick. So I'll utilize people, for instance, who work at the pools and so forth. So that's why that, that is so much lower. Uh, and so that's quite a, it's, that's a, that's, that's quite a savings. Um, as far as the FY20 um, revenues and expenses, it was looking very good for it before we entered the spring season and, and COVID. Um, I will say though that we don't have all the final numbers and, and Sonia, we just, it, it's not quite done. We just finished the fiscal year. So we don't have everything together, but we'll be able to re provide you with a report um, but, um, you know, we did the best we could under the circumstances. Uh, we were limited by the numbers of um, people we could have play at a time. We had to have 15 minutes between each foursome, which is not, normally we do somewhere around eight minutes. So it's a, it was a different structure. Uh, we had to completely, we were a no tea time facility before that. So we had to completely reinvent ourselves and figure out how to provide tea times through a program in square. So it's a, it has been a monumental under, undertaking to um, kind of reinvent ourselves up there. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, the, the creative uses of the course we are always looking into. Uh, certainly the clubhouse uh, is, could be more versatile, but it does have its limitations in that it is, uh, was built as more of a three season facility, not a four season. It's very, very poorly insulated. Uh, at, and we we have plans this year in 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 our objectives to really look at that facility, bring a group of community members and experts together to see what we can do in terms of um, you know looking at alternative uses of the course, and certainly that the clubhouse is part of that uh, discussion. Um, as far as fee subsidies, let me tell we do we are involved in a. Um, USGA program, United States Golf Association program called Sticks for Kids, where any child or parent can come in and request uh, a set of golf clubs for their children to um, for free. They're available for free. We lend them out, and there is no charge. And we also do have the camp, and we are we are actively recruiting right now to uh, in different areas where ch children normally wouldn't have a golf experience to to fill that camp so we're doing our best but we could be doing more and we're working on it but right now we're pretty um how to say this we're we're pretty thin in terms of staffing because we've got people as i said before my full-time staff working up puffers pond i've got people working shifts at cherry hill in the clubhouse so we're we're doing the best we can with what we have, and certainly the long-range goal would be to provide those, Kathy. But uh, yeah, thank you for your question. That's good. Thank Did you. Did I answer it all? <laughs> yeah, no, and I see you up there a lot, Barb, so some of the full-time staff are you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dorothy? Okay, I thought it was Pat next. Uh, all right, Pat. Uh, <laughs> Doesn't matter. Okay, uh, if you don't, I, it would be good because I'm hopping, or Kathy's helped me bridge back to subsidies, um, and I understand there's a difference between regular uh, courses and the outreach uh, courses. And after um, people aren't quarantined, if that ever happens, uh, will there be subsidized classes for kids? And um, in terms of uh, the golf course, the sticks for kids sounds wonderful, but are there then fees uh, or classes that those kids are, or work uh, summer camps around golf that the kids can't attend if they don't have the money? Yes, we do. It, it, they would need to apply for the fee subsidies, the parents, as they normally would. Yes, but they can get up to 100% fee subsidies for those. And is there a limit to the number of families that could get that? 
Well, currently due to COVID right now, the so, limit yeah. to the camps are 10. So yeah. 10 participants. So we'll see that change, you know, as we move further into the, uh, you know, the next few years, the couple of years, hopefully less than that. Thank you for everything you're doing. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have spent a number of years at the pools uh, with um, grandchildren swimming lessons in the water and out of the water. And my experience there is probably the most integrated experience in the town of Amherst. So I, I think that you're doing a great outreach. And I think, um, you know, there's discounts advertised in the booklet that comes out for spring and fall um, when we're in regular life anyway, uh, for everybody. So I have a small question and I hate, I'm sure I have the, know what the answer is, but is the waiting pool open? Cause I love the waiting pool at Mill River. I used to spend some really happy times there, but have you been able to staff that? Yes, yes, it's open. Great. Absolutely, Great. very Thank popular. Uh, our numbers, we're, we have to, we, we have, uh, we can only operate at 40% capacity. Right. Uh, but that still allows us up to 70 people in, in uh, the Mill River um, facility. So that's, that's actually a, Pretty large number. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else for Barb on either of these two programs? Because yeah, uh, I'm not going to add. I think Lynn, do you have a question? Yeah. Who does uh, veteran services? I was going to ask that next, uh, but I wanted to get through. Thank you, uh, with Barb. Um, I do have some questions about where we are with the golf course and uh, whether how we're seeing it financially, whether we uh, are making it work now on a fee basis or whether there's tax subsidy going into it. But I think that what I'm going to do is send those kinds of questions through Sean and uh, let Sean try and respond to them separately and then report back to the committee as opposed to doing it today. Um, and uh, as a, partly as a matter of efficiency and partly as a matter of giving some time to put together the response. But uh, we've, as a town, um, had various conversations over time as to what the cost is to administer the golf program and the degree to which the town needs to subsidize it. And it's just something that I think that the committee needs to pay attention to. Uh, I don't know if you have anything you want to say on the subject right now, but if not, um, I'm going to leave it to a uh, conversation. I'll start with Sean and then have him follow through. No, that would make sense to me. I would think um, also we just need to get the final numbers together at this point. So we'll have a better picture to provide you. Okay, uh, Kathy. Um, yeah, I just, you know, I, do, I understand this has been an ongoing issue and it's why I partly asked of did people start using it in the fall? Like I understand the spring is just completely a different world. Um, but I think, you know, we, we think of the golf course as different than we think of the pools. We don't expect the pools to cover their expenses. So we might just want to get, I was trying to just look at what are the revenues we get for something and what are the expenses. And then Pat's question, I think is relevant on a, if we want people to get out of doors and be using services, what ways can we make them um, affordable and accessible? So uh, I'm just going to add to your questions, Andy, when you send them in, if, uh, if I, you can show me what you're doing so I don't send my questions into Sean and have him have to answer two people. Okay, thank you. And I wasn't trying to suggest uh, right. whether subsidy is something that's sable. I just wanted to understand where we are. Yeah. I, I was on the same page, just wondering how, uh, how, we, how are we doing? We're going to have the next conversation at an appropriate time. But uh, this is about the 21 budget. If there are, any, are there any other questions? If not, uh, Barb, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, and You're welcome. Thank you. Lynn asks the question, is there anybody here to speak to veterans? Sean? So, so we can speak to it a little bit because there was a change here um, and we can go through and highlight that change. Elizabeth you, want me, Duffy you want me just to go into it? Um, yeah. Sean. Sean. Elizabeth yes. Duffy. 
as her hand up. Oh, sure. Yes, Liz? You're muted, you're muted, Liz. We do have veterans programs here in the assessor's office. It depends on what type of uh, veterans information you need. Yeah, Liz, do you wanna hang on for a little bit longer in case there's questions on the, um, the exemption? That's why I'm here, if there's any senior uh, program or tactical leave programs that you need me for. Okay, perfect, thanks, Liz. Liz is our assessor if you haven't met her yet. Um, so I'll just go quickly through the, the change. So there is a, um, a line for veterans benefits, which are for um, cash benefits that we reduced this year. Um, uh, but it's on the page, page 100 where it says veterans benefits, you'll see it's reduced 53,392. So that's a line that we looked at history and we adjusted this number to align with what's actually been paid out in the past. Um, and as you'll, you'll know in a few places in the budget book, um, the town managers made a commitment that we'll honor any requests for benefits that come in, but this was one area where we could align the budget with what's actually been spent in the past. Um, and that's really the only significant change in the veterans benefits uh, section. So the only question that I had on veterans benefits, and then I'll see that I see the drug dealer hand up and I just sort of keep it moving. Um, the, do we know the um, number of people who are currently employed on the staff of the uh, Central Hampshire Veterans District and whether they assign specific staff to work with, um, with Amherst and our veterans, or is it spread over in a larger group? Uh, I'll let Sonia maybe able to weigh in on this a little bit more, but we do have a individual um, that uh, regularly visits Amherst. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure how many staff they are, but um, it's the same staff for all the all the towns that are in the um, the regional area. So we deal with. Um, Rebecca Twining, who's the administrator there, and Steve Connors is our veterans agent. And we have one, is he voluntary, I believe, over at no. the bank? So, so Steve Connor is the veterans director. He serves the central, whatever the name is, the, uh, we're part of a group with a number of towns, 13 towns, I think, and based in Northampton. He oversees that entire operation. Uh, we also have an office in the Bang Center for the veteran services, and there's a staff person who comes there, I think, three or four days a week, uh, or, or has been up until COVID, uh, who's there to support veterans' needs uh, in the Bang Center on a regular basis. Okay, thank you. Dorothy? Okay, I had questions which I submitted on veteran services, and that it wasn't clear to me who in the town of Amherst dispensed any of these services and um it just i guess what the question i had was um okay i said there was a 15 percent decrease in the budget but it still leaves the line higher than other previous budgets so that was question one there's no staff expense listed so if nobody from our town is being paid to do it is somebody else doing it who is not who is not part of their official duties it just was very confusing to me I gather, so I figured, well, most of the money listed must be our dues that we give to this larger regional veterans group. Yeah. That's well, all I can give a quick explanation for history, and maybe I can then uh, move this along very fast that way. Um, originally, veteran services were provided by a veterans agent for the town of Amherst, and uh, we found that to be very inefficient uh, back when I was on the old finance committee. And uh, so that uh, we got together as, provide, as permitted by state statute with a number of other towns under the leadership of then mayor um, of Northampton, uh, Claire Higgins, and uh, created the central district, central Hampshire district as a more efficient way to provide services um, and uh, which was why I was asking whether there was somebody who was regularly coming to Amherst and whether there was a regular office hour piece to it, which was the understanding in setting up the central district. But uh, uh, John Musanti, Steph, Stephanie O'Keefe, who at that time was chair of the select board and I represented Amherst at that, in those meetings. 
and that's the history of how it was created and i think that it has been a very effective system for what i and of course the veteran services um, that are provided um, that are listed is really a question of monetary assistance that is provided according to state law and um, there is a portion that has to be reimbursed by the town uh, but there's also a state statutory portion and those are required on an eligibility basis and so it's just a question of making sure we have adequate staff to do the outreach to veterans to make sure that they are served um, and uh, once they are identified and they're determined to be eligible then they're in the uh, system to receive benefits the variation depends upon usually it's sean can correct me if i'm wrong on this the amount of money um, that is needed because um, at times you know uh, who's eligible um, does cycle over time and uh, that's i think basically it uh, i don't know if sean or paul or sonia can you add to what i said so the office is staffed on tuesdays and wednesdays from eight to four the office in Northampton is staffed five days a week, normal business hours. Who staffs at Namhurst? Uh, we have a, a, there's a staff member from the, the region that comes over and staffs it, yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, all staffing is done out of the central district and that way they can all be under common supervision of Steve Connors, who's really an expert in the entire subject and uh, uh, it's not only more cost effective, but I think provides better service than the old system. Um, anything else on veteran services on questions? So um, at that point, I would, I think we were ready to move on to uh, conservation inspections. Do people want to take a, say two or three minute break? If not, I'm gonna, I think Dor Dorothy nodded her head. She didn't do a verbal. Okay. Why don't we do it? But let's be. I, mean, really I couldn't wait. I, I took my break, but I figured other people must be human, so it'd be good. <laughs> I think you should just have a break and not ask us. Two hours okay. in. We'll take, we'll take but let's make it as brief as we can yeah. so that we can get going then again. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's stretch. You're right. Stretching. Stand up.
does, let me see if everybody's back or if we have a quorum back. Uh, so let me uh, check on, do a, do a quorum um, check on this. Uh, Dorothy Pam, are you here? Yes, I am. Okay, and Pat, Angelus? Yes. And Lynn? Yes. And Kathy? Yes. Okay, and, I, and so all the members from the council are here, and we had two others uh, who were here. Bob Hegner, are you back? Yep. <clears throat> and Sharon Pavanelli? Sharon may still be on break, but I uh, don't want to take much any extra time because I think we have most of the committee back. And uh, so uh, are we going to lead with Dave Zomack or is, how do we want to yeah. That'd be great, Andrew. Okay, Dave, let me. Sure. And, and I'll try to be brief here. I, I think uh, we all recognize the lateness of the hour, but pleased to be with you this afternoon to talk about the functional area conservation and development. And just as a recap, it, it does include a, a broad range of departments. We have planning, zoning, conservation, inspection services, under inspection services. Of course, uh, some years ago, we moved the uh, health inspectors under, under Mr. Mora. Um, and more recently, um, we moved the facilities uh, uh, coordination and supervision for facilities uh, under inspection services as well. So it's a broad uh, functional area. It affords us the opportunity to work on a wide range of projects and initiatives throughout town. Um, very proud of our efforts, um, in particular to bring permitting, uh, for the most part, uh, all under one, uh, one roof, under, under one shop. There is still uh, collaborative work we do with the fire department and DPW, but for the most part, we've tried to create kind of a one-stop shop for developers, for homeowners, uh, for people looking to uh, do licensing, et cetera. And I think it's, it's shown great benefits and we've gotten very good feedback on that. I think um, a recent example of that, certainly uh, working with our, our boards and committees was uh, our collective effort to get uh, restaurants uh, up and running in this new COVID environment. And again, in very short order, working with various boards and committees and of course the town council through some of the zoning efforts uh, to really uh, respond to this uh, unprecedented pandemic. Um, our work depends on collaboration. As I've said, uh, we work very closely with DPW, LSSC, the schools, the fire department, the bid in the chamber. Um, joined today, of course, by Rob Mora, our building commissioner and assistant director of our functional area. Uh, Jeremiah LaPlante is uh, new and we welcomed Jeremiah a few months ago. He is our um, facilities and maintenance manager and we'll hear from him in a few minutes. And of course, Christine Brestrup, our planning director. And you know, we're fortunate all of us to be supported by some really talented and uh, experienced staff. I think what you'll hear today about the functional area when we talk about our FY21 goals, um, you'll hear about uh, efforts to make our, our community greener, more sustainable. Um, safer and, and healthier in many ways um, to improve the condition of our town buildings is, is a critical piece and one of the reasons we brought Jeremiah on and, and he'll talk more about that in detail. Um, part of our efforts in this functional area are to secure grants and we do a good job of it over the years that I've been here we brought in millions of dollars for the town for playgrounds, parks, infrastructure and a lot of that is done collaboratively with other departments. But projects like Groff Park, Dog Parks, Kendrick Park, downtown and village center work, often there is a connection to uh, conservation and development. Um, we do a lot of work and our efforts are, are focused with the planning board, the zoning board of appeals. Uh, more recently, of course, with the CRC and some of the council um, um, committees. Um, and I think the focus over the next couple of years and, and frankly in the next few months is going to be on zoning. Uh, we know that we need to um, uh, make uh, uh, major changes to our zoning and we're geared up and uh, we're prepared to, to work with the CRC, the planning board, zoning board, and of course the council on, on zoning. So without um, going into more detail, at least in my intro, I'd like to turn it over to Rob. I think we'll go with inspection services and then Jeremiah for facilities, Chris with planning, and then I'll just try to do a quick bookend at the end to talk about conservation and sustainability. 
So I'll turn it over to Rob. Okay, Rob, hi. Welcome. Hi, uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to start by just mentioning a couple of uh, recent uh, projects or uh, work that uh, Inspection Services has been involved in. Uh, North Square uh, project uh, uh, reached completion on the residential units. It's 130 residential units uh, out on Coles Road. It's uh, 22,000 square feet of commercial space, which is still vacant, uh, but uh, the outside of the building and the grounds, uh, the site are complete, uh, ready to be built out for those commercial spaces. Uh, if you're traveling Route 9 uh, and 408 Northampton Road, you'd notice uh, Aspen Heights uh, is uh, well into construction. The building is up. Uh, the roof is constructed now, uh, and they are beginning to work, uh, the work on the interior of that building. Uh, we, uh, as a reminder, are now supporting uh, all of the uh, licensing that used to be handled by the Select Board and Town Manager's Office in the past. Uh, alcohol licenses are, are the main focus of that work. Uh, through the Board of License Commissioners. Uh, we offer the uh, staff support to the board. Uh, some of the uh, recent uh, work that the board had completed over the past uh, 12 months included the alcohol food service regulations and BYOB. Uh, they are continuing uh, around their uh, normal uh, licensing uh, processing and uh, more recently with outdoor dining, uh, which has been very uh, active with, as, as you know. Uh, in the recent weeks. Uh, they are continuing to work on other items such as uh, addressing short-term rental regulations, updates to our residential rental regulations, uh, private club, and other, uh, other areas. Uh, moving ahead to more current uh, information, uh, you know, following uh, the last several months of really significant low permit activity for building electrical and plumbing, uh, June uh, seems to be more in line with uh, what we've seen consistent with other years. Uh, so that's a good sign as we, as we move into the summer. Um, David mentioned a little bit about the, uh, the change in the reorganization of the facilities department that included the new facilities maintenance uh, manager, uh, Jeremiah LaPlante, who you'll hear from shortly. Uh, but that uh, uh, happened, I, Je uh, Jeremiah joined us back in April of uh, this year. Um, talking about um, some of the things we're really looking forward to is uh, our new permitting program. Uh, we've talked about this, I think, probably for several years now uh, in these meetings and others uh, about streamlining, uh, creating efficiency, and online capability. Uh, so we're, you know, really happy uh, about being there finally, and we are uh, days, any day, ready to launch uh, the new permitting program, which will be first uh, to issue license renewals for the residential rental properties, and then hopefully very soon after move into building electrical plumbing, uh, fire permits, and code enforcement. Um, you know, it sounds like uh, this is an effort led by the IT department working with the, the vendor and uh, a, a lot of staff in the various departments to develop and build these uh, these programs, uh, it looks like all of that, what I just mentioned, will be up and running uh, this fall, uh, which is really exciting. Um, I think David also mentioned this. I just want to note uh, out of interest, the outdoor dining uh, uh, applications uh, that have been processed over the last several weeks uh, resulted in 15 establishments that are doing uh, table service outdoors. Uh, and we have a couple, uh, three locations that are offering tables just for takeout um, uh, customers. I'll uh, stop there. Questions. Well, thank you. I, think I really appreciate all you've been doing to get the outdoor activity for restaurants going. And uh, you really answered my one question, which was what we thought was happening in inspection activities as we begin FY21, since FY20 is now behind us and kind of answered that we're returning to a more normal stance. Are there other questions from the committee? Bob, Bob and then Lynn. Uh, yeah, I had a question on the inspection services on page 88, um, the residential rental permitting program. Um, it looks like there's been a decline from FY16 to FY19 and a large decline between 18 and 19. 
Is that like an annual permitting process? Is it a one-time permitting process? Could you explain that a little bit? Sure. Th this is an annual permit. Um, the numbers have declined since the program started back in 2014. Uh, the what we're really hopeful with this new permitting program is to be able to get uh, have the the ability to better track these permits so one thing that we're not able to do efficiently is to uh, follow up and really see why a, a, a property didn't uh, renew their permit uh, unless we're responding to a complaint uh, we really haven't been able to, to look at uh, the, the permits from that level otherwise there is a there is a, um, a little bit of a fluctuation in the numbers year to year because uh, the renewal is on July 1st. So depending on which fiscal year they apply, apply in, if they're late, you know, so the numbers could shift a little bit, but um, you're absolutely right. There is a significant drop and we're hoping to, to find out why in the coming year or years as we can better track these. Okay, thanks. Good. Um, actually that was one of my questions and I really urge that you do that my concern would be that people are still renting they're just not filing the forms um, the other piece that um, is and we'll be looking forward to and that is what you've learned from this um, terrific permitting process uh, that you've been doing um, the department has really stepped to the plate and it makes a difference in terms of just how the town looks but I assume that we will have learned some things and maybe even figure out more ways to make permitting faster and still be very, very thorough in town. So it's a word of encouragement and thanks. Kathy? Um, staying on the permitting, um, when you permit, if do you have a computerized system that would allow you to know you just permit in a place that has three bedrooms and two bathrooms or two bedrooms and one bathroom or, you know, I could go on with the possible variants on it. Um, and associated with that, um, do you, I know it's a self-inspection system on uh, how many people can the landlord put into that space, um, rent it out. Um, one of the things I observed when I was knocking on doors running for council is that my voter registration list for a place that had two bedrooms, one bathroom, had eight names on it. So it seemed based on the number of cars and the number of names, there were probably more in that house than we thought. So a combination of what do you have that you know when you permit on the space and have we ever, to what extent do we go back and say, you've actually put a lot more people in that house than we think you're permitted for. So what's the flip side? Is it only that a neighbor calls? Is it only, initiated in some way. So it's the two the two sides of what do we know and then what would trigger a go look at it. That's it. Hmm, Rob? Yeah, so uh, currently our permitting system is very limited, although it is uh, electronic, uh, the amount of information we get at, a, at the time of application is, is minimal. We, uh, for example, will know the number of units on a property that are, that's associated with a permit. Our new system that we're about to launch, we're asking a few more questions and, we, and the number of bedrooms is something that we're looking to capture uh, and be able to report on. And uh, we have with this new program, the ability to really ask for anything we think is valuable information. And, and I think we'll continue to do that and look for uh, what is the, the uh, appropriate information we look for. Uh, we are designed and have been from the very beginning to be uh, a department that's uh, ready for complaint response. Uh, we do not do proactive enforcement, uh, patrolling of, of uh, uh, neighborhoods uh, to look for uh, signs or evidence of violations, uh, particularly with the, uh, the number of uh, occupants in a building. So we, we will respond to complaints, we'll investigate and, and take whatever action is needed to bring the property into compliance. Uh, but really it is the, uh, uh, the owner or the landlord or the property manager's responsibility to certify during the application process 
that they're in compliance with our requirements with the, the, the regulations and to distribute the appropriate documents with that information to all of their tenants. Kathy, any follow-up or? Uh, no, um, my follow-up is more some questions about um, what would an alternative system look like, but you answered my questions on what now exists. Thank you. Anything else from other members of the committee? I don't have any myself because I actually asked under public health about restaurant inspections and got an answer on that. So I don't think we're going to need to go back there. Anything, if I don't see anything else, um, appreciate it, Rob. And um, thank you for the good work you're doing on getting our restaurants backing up and going. Um, so where do you want to go next? Do we go to facilities or we says, can. Says, says Rob and Jeremiah? Yeah, we were going to go to facilities next and then planning. Okay, and so everybody knows facilities is actually in the budget book under general government on page 42. So that if you're looking for where we are and with that, uh, and if, uh, Jeremiah, welcome aboard. And I don't know if you have any introductory comments as you want to make to the committee. Well, I appreciate you having me and allowing me to speak on uh, the facilities side of the town government. Um, I think Dave and, and Rob both sort of established uh, uh, the, this organizational structure. Um, I do have uh, a few uh, maintenance assistants and, and the maintenance technicians uh, that, that I oversee their work. Uh, and we are working on uh, just keeping that, those environments within the buildings uh, clean and safe as, as was stated. And being sure that we're maintaining the equipment as best as our ability. Um, I'm trying to expand on some of the different uh, preventive uh, work that has been done and trying to push that forward. Uh, with uh, more robust preventive maintenance uh, program for, and, and this is looking at all of the towns. Um, I think part of this, this uh, downswing in, in business has allowed me to really dive into each one of the, the different facilities, look at the equipment, sort of assess the equipment, its condition, the age, um, and, and try to take some of the historical information and hopefully establish a, a better idea of uh, um, sort of a predictive, uh, predictive uh, uh, maintenance moving forward so we can establish our capital improvements. Uh, I know that we have experienced some catastrophic and some minor failures, uh, but I'm hoping to, with, with this new program, uh, eliminate those catastrophic failures and, hope, and we can prepare for those um, well in advance, uh, so we don't get those 200 and 300 and 400 thousand dollar hits, uh, and, and that's. I'm using technology that we we already have, um, working with Sean and IT. I'm hoping to establish a work order system, so it will be automated, uh, that anyone on our Outlook system will have access to. Um, so it helps with um, tasks, task management, uh, and scheduling. Uh, it could be as big as equipment maintenance to as little as miscellaneous work that comes in. Uh, and this will help with just uh, looking at trends, budgets, payroll, um, and like I said, capital, capital improvements. Um, some of the big capital uh, work that we're looking at right now is the police station roof design and repair. Um, we're hoping to have that taken care of, but also looking at um, whether or not we can put uh, solar on it. Will the, will the infrastructure support that? And, and as Dave mentioned er, earlier, a lot of our work is for these green communities and trying to reduce our, our carbon footprint and, and less reliance on, on these uh, fossil fuels. Um, so having that secondary piece to, to that infrastructure will be extremely helpful. 
another project that we're looking at is redoing the, the front steps of town hall. Um, Rob spearheaded the, the front doors and, and having those done and they do look uh, great now. Um, it really, really has uh, changed the face of the, face of the front of the building. And we're hoping to uh, get those stairs pulled out and reset uh, so they are uh, more compliant because if, you, if you've walked up them, um, the, a number of those steps are, are uh, varying heights. So it's, it makes it challenging for a lot of people. Um, another area is, is heating and cooling in some of these older buildings. Um, Munson has very old antiquated heating systems as well as North Amherst School. Um, working with um, Stephanie uh, in, in some of the green communities and seeing what, what sort of funding and grants are out there that can help us um, mo modernize the, these heating systems. Uh, it, it, it is, uh, it is uh, fossil fuel uh, guzzling um, old furnaces over there. So we want to, we're looking at heat, heat pumps, um, air source and air to air and air to water. Um, so I, in the next couple of weeks, I'll, I'll be meeting with some mechanical companies and trying to get that going because it would be nice to have some of that stuff established before this next heating season. Um, we also have uh, lighting upgrades that, that we're just waiting on. So we're, we're waiting on some confirmation for the grant funding from green communities. Once we have that confirmation, we'll be able to uh, get that project started. Uh, and it's uh, retrofitting lighting to LED in uh, Town Hall, Munson Library, and the Amherst PD. So, so it's sort of low hanging fruit, but it will really help us um, move in, in in several directions. One, it, it helps us reduce our expenses, and two, it it, uh, it aligns us with with our ultimate mission. Uh, and then I have a, a number of some little small projects that I'm working on um, to sort of expand on on what Mary Beth has done for the Bang Center. Just kind of looking on the outside, uh, they, there's a courtyard that's really underutilized, and I think if we do something with that courtyard she it will be able to move some of that programming out there. Um, right now that, that courtyard isn't accessible from the interior or really the exterior if, if, uh, if you aren't able to ambulate up and down steps. Um, so we, we wanna take care of that. Uh, and there's also the set of stairs that go along the, the backside of Bangs down to Musanti that are in disrepair and uh, I've brought someone out and waiting on some pricing for that. So I would be happy to have that corrected. Well, thank you. Um, there's a lot that you brought up that really have to do with uh, kind of capital needs. And um, so I think that uh, Kathy, if she needs to speak to it, Kathy Shane is uh, the chair of our capital planning committee. And uh, I know that uh, when we meet again in the fall as the joint capital planning committee, we will want to get a better assessment of our buildings and where we uh, will need to go. And that that's the appropriate point where we really need to delve into kind of the the list of what are the conditions of the building and what needs to be done to bring them up. Andy Flynn was trying to get your attention. Good. Lynn and then Kathy both, Kathy's hand is up and Lynn. Yeah, I, I think Kathy and I are probably gonna go to the same place and that is first of all, welcome. Uh, second of all, we look forward to that list as we uh, look at our buildings and try to keep the ones that we're not planning to replace in um, max, get them back up to maximum uh, usage and repair um, and understanding what that will mean for us from a capital standpoint. Um, the, I noticed that this, the book talked a lot about the reorganization and perhaps David, you or someone, or Rob, or someone needs to just explain what you did to reorganize maintenance uh, and then bring Jeremiah in. 
Well, I can take that. So we previously had a shared maintenance um, position, uh, Ron Bohanowitz with the school department. And then um, and when that changed, uh, we were still seeking a shared position for overall building maintenance. And we, we uh, collaborated with the library director for uh, their uh, maintenance person and that we did that successfully and that was sort of a you know we, we on these situations we try to work with each other because it's a high skill um, hard to fill position typically because there's, there's you know, a lot of mechanical knowledge needed and uh, ma management of staff and things like that um, last year we decided that um, we were going to seek a different arrangement and a uh, library went back to their traditional setting and we went out and sought a higher level um, building uh, maintenance system. Uh, we, t we removed one position and um, that person is no longer with the town and replaced them with uh, Jeremiah at a higher level and able to oversee all of our staff at the, in, in the staff. Man, uh, maintains the town hall, the APD, Munson Library, North Amherst Building, Bank in the Banks Community Center. So those are, there's daily maintenance issues there. And then there's also the sort of um, larger capital or small capital projects, not the big capital projects, but the small things like fixing a roof or HVAC, things like that. And we had a backlog of those things because we had gone through uh, a couple of years of trying different things uh, once, um, uh, Ron left and then and so that's where we're putting our effort right now. So the, I guess my follow on question then is I'm assuming when we look at the uh, inventory of our assets that um, some of this will be brought into not only yes we have this building but yes this is the condition of this building and what needs to be done. Yep yes exactly. Thank you. Kathy? Uh, yes, we were on the same page, Lynn. Um, so I, I will continue rather than repeat. Um, the One of the things we did not get in the spring, um, actually it was in May, uh, because of the change in all the budgeting process, with, uh, was a chance to look at inventory, um, either whether it was automobile, vehicle inventory, or buildings. And so um, the uh, there, the, there's this one or two sentences in our charter that says uh, the town council might want to think about what they want in an inventory like that. <laughs> um, so when Lynn just said the state of the building, what are we using it for? You know, I'm thinking of things like we've got the Hitchcock Center, and my understanding is it's just sitting there empty right now, but it's a plan of what are we planning on doing with it. So. Would that be helpful for a couple of us to at least put together a bulleted list? Um, or would it be helpful for you to share such a list with us where we say, yeah, that looks like about what we think it would be so we don't get something and ask you to redo it? So that's so, the first question. And then just the second one, Paul, is mm -hmm. the list that Jeremiah just gave us, some of them I think are on the small and don't need to come to joint capital. Some were on the delayed list, like the front steps of town hall. And a question was raised during JCPC, since it's a historic building, could that be a Community Preservation Act money? So it's, I don't wanna get a lot involved in this, but those are the kinds of questions on which, which are already covered because we've had funding from the past and now we're gonna spend it. So the two, the two yeah. pieces. So the first piece, um, what, Sean uh, is really working on this. That's his, it's his project. And what we have looked at is the inventory. It includes age, condition, maintenance, and repair history, remaining useful life, and other features. And so that's what we're starting with. If the council, I mean, we can't go through every individual counselor's desires. If the council says we want to add other things in this list, the council should make that decision what it wants to add to that list. But we're I'm working at the charter, what the charter requires. So um, you know, if, when the council says we'd like this or the other things, that's up to the council to make that decision. Um, yeah, in terms of um, you know, I think having Sean here and Jeremiah here and uh, Rob more involved in the capital is going to give us a much better handle on what our our capital needs are, small and large, for um, our existing built structure, and that's been our focus. 
in terms of uh, what are we going to have to invest in our existing buildings, and, and and that will help the council decide: do we want to keep them or not? Is it is it something we want to uh, get rid of or not? I I just want to let you know I had a couple District One people who follow this when they saw Jeremiah had been hired. They said, "Hooray!" <laughs> I mean, it was like, "Yes." So, so did we. <laughs> <laughs> High expectations. Uh, so anything additional that people want to ask Jeremiah now, knowing we're going to come back to it, but with a different committee. Seeing none, um, I don't know if I want to actually ask one question. We have one member of the public who's been very patient. Uh, and if you were looking to do, uh, to make any public comment, it would be helpful if you'd raise your hand so that I would know that. And if not, uh, I'll know that too. So for member of the public who's here, if there's a desire to make public comment to the committee, please raise your hand so I'm aware of it. Um, and having said that, um, I'll turn it back to Dave so that we can move on to the next piece, I think. Sure, well, I think we're going to roll right. You're muted, Dave. Chris, do you want to jump right in on planning? Sure. Hi, how are you? How, how's everybody today? I'm Chris Brestrup, planning director, and I wanted to share some things with you about the planning department. Um, so, so we have a staff of five people which includes three planners and a, an administrative assistant and myself. And we also share a position with um, inspection services, which is the permit administrator. Um, we were recently for, fortunate enough to fill a position that has been vacant for a whole year. Um, we've hired a, a, a planner. Um, we had a planner who left last June, I guess it was. Anyway, our new planner is really a dynamic person. He's very, um, talented in many ways. He's a good writer. He's got great graphic skills and he's now working on grant applications for us. And in his first month of full-time work, he uh, managed to get us a grant, a $10,000 grant. So I'll tell you about that later. But I think that was a, a pretty good thing to do in his first few weeks of working. Um, so the planning department supports um, 10 or more of the boards and committees in town. And those include Planning Board, Zoning Board of Appeals, the Design Review Board, the Historical Commission, and the Local Historic District Commission. Um, and there are probably at least six or seven more, more that we support, um, which means we go to meetings, we have to follow all their paperwork and really help them out with uh, to understand what they're doing. Um, in terms of our accomplishments, uh, I, I'm just gonna highlight a few. Um, one of our main activities is permitting. So as I said, we help the uh, permitting boards and committees to do their work. Um, so among the projects that we've recently permitted is um, 462 Main Street. It's Nancy Hamill's old office building down by the railroad tracks. And recently it was purchased by John Robleski. And he's going to um, construct a new mixed use building there, which will include 24 apartments and a small office space. So I think that'll be a really nice addition to that end of town. You can probably see some of the work starting. He's cut some trees down there. We also have Amir McCheese uh, Southeast Court Apartments, which came to the town council recently because of some work that Mr. McChee wants to do within the town right of way. So that's another 57 apartments and three retail spaces in East Amherst Village Center. Um, two more uh, projects that I wanted to highlight are Amherst Media is finally coming before the planning board with a building that's been um, being designed over the course of the past year. It's been the subject of seven public hearing sessions with the local historic district commission. The commission eventually uh, granted a certificate of, of appropriateness for the building and now it's before the planning board and it, it looks like a good solution to this, um, this site and this project. Um, Valley CDC is the, uh, the other project that I'm going to mention, which is um, currently before the Zoning Board of Appeals as a comprehensive permit. It's a 28-unit affordable studio apartment project. 
Um, it's meant to serve um, moderate income, low income, and homeless individuals with housing. Um, it's received uh, a grant money from the town in the form of CDBG funds and CPAC money, and that is currently going through the Zoning Board of Appeals process. They've had two public hearings on it so far, and Maureen Pollock is spearheading that effort. Um, other accomplishments that don't have anything to do with permitting are, um, as I said before, Ben uh, Brager, our new planner, managed to work with the bid and get a, a Solomon Foundation grant for $10,000, mm -hmm. which is um, reflected in some of the new site furnishings that you see downtown. Those beautiful uh, red um, sort of sienna colored um, umbrellas and other features, planters, etc., cetera, um, were able to be purchased by by that money, and that was a really good accomplishment. We're also applying for a Mass DOT grant, Mass uh, Department of Transportation. Um, I think we're going, we ended up uh, with a list um, that's about $270,000 worth of um, material, again, to support um, safe travels, safe walking, safe, safe bicycling and driving, as well as downtown outdoor dining. So uh, that grant application will go in either later today or tomorrow morning. We're very excited about that. And again, that's something that Ben's been working on. Um, among the other projects that we have going on, uh, many of you came to the Groff Park um, opening yesterday, the opening of the playground, and that's a project that's been in the works for a long time. The planning department had a lot to do with that, both in terms of getting the grant money to um, have the project go forward, then reviewing it with the planning board, um, and then Nate Malloy just has worked uh, very hard over the last year to get that um, in the ground and finally constructed. And here we are, and we're very excited about that. Um, we also have the Amherst Dog Park, which will be under construction later this summer. And that was also um, a grant funded project. And um, we worked with the DPW on that. Kendrick Park Playground, which is something that went through the uh, planning department, um, planning board, and design review board. It's also the result of uh, grants that were gotten from the park grant program with the state and some CPAC money. So <clears throat> we have a, a beautiful design that we worked with LSSC and the DPW on, and we're hoping that that will go out to bid later this month and be in uh, under construction in the fall. Recently, we received a, a housing choice designation. It's our second housing choice designation um, in the last few years. And that's a designation by the state for uh, cities and towns that are leaders in creating new housing and including affordable housing. So we're very pleased with that. And that designation opens the door for us to um, apply for other types of grants. Right now we have um, a grant to create a sidewalk along East Pleasant Street. I'm not sure exactly if it's been built or yet or not, but I think we got about $190,000 because of our housing choice designation for that project. We're also working on an Americans with Disabilities Act um, transition plan, and um, Jeremiah is gonna be helping us with that. We have consultants flying in next week to begin to analyze um, town buildings and properties for, for handicapped accessibility and they'll be producing a plan to show us how we can make our facilities more handicapped accessible. We have an MOD, Mass Office of Disabilities grant for about $44,000 that we're going to use to build crosswalks and handicapped ramps in the downtown area to make that more accessible. And what else? So in addition, I just wanted to mention that we apply for and administer over $800,000 in CDBG grant money um, every year and that pays for social services and construction projects and the current construction project is a multi-use path along East Hadley Road. Um, so in addition to these grants and projects, we've also been um, hoping to work with the town council, the building commissioner and the planning board on uh, updating and revising our zoning bylaw. We have begun to update our master plan, but I think that there's more um, interest currently in working on zoning. So the master plan may take a kind of um, secondary place to working on zoning. Um, oh, I did want to mention that we're, we hope we're in the final stages of our flood insurance rate map project. We did go through an appeal process. We actually had an appeal. 
So now we have to go through another um, 90 day appeal period and then we're into the compliance period, but we're hoping that within a few months we will be coming to town council with um, some maps and some zoning text to have uh, town council adopt. And I just wanted to talk a little bit, bit about the challenges that we had mentioned in our uh, budget. Um, and one of the challenges is uh, maintaining communication with residents. Residents are very eager to find out about the projects that we're working on, particularly the permitting projects, but also the Kendrick Park and Groff Park, et cetera. So we're trying really hard to reach out to community members, both online and in other formats to um, explain what we're doing and to put as much information as we can online. And we always welcome people to call us. And even in this uh, you know, COVID-19 uh, situation, we have been communicating very much with um, residents about projects that are going through uh, our office. Um, so let's see, I just wanted to make one more comment, which had to do with a question that came in from Sean. And I think it might have been sent in by one of the council members, and it had to do with uh, marijuana establishments. And the question was, how many marijuana establishments do we currently have in Amherst? And um, I think the secondary part of that was, uh, what was the income from the past year for uh, those establishments? And so we do have one marijuana establishment that's currently operating up on Meadow Street. It's, a, um, it's called RISE, and it is a, med a medical and uh, adult use marijuana establishment. In other words, it sells medical marijuana as well as adult use marijuana. We have three other establishments that are um, working on getting themselves going. They've received their permits, but they just uh, have to do the work to get their buildings open. Um, and then we have a cultivation facility that is trying to be established on Route 9. It's in back of the winery. And there's one other possible uh, retail establishment on College Street. So that's the story on marijuana. Um, and according to Sonia's office, uh, we've received a total of $206,000 in the past year um, for, uh, from that um, type of uh, business. So um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about the planning department and what we do. And thanks for listening. Well, thank you. So let me see if there are any questions, Lynn. Um, I, I, I wanna make sure I keep my questions to those things that are financial, but I, it's, it's very hard. <laughs> There's a, a whole part of me that has other questions. Um, and, but one of the ones that is, somewhat financial is that I, we seem to see, be seeing more and more of the uh, applications to be for mixed use. And it's my understanding that that allows people to then not have to do um, low income or affordable housing. Am I correct on that? May I answer that? Yes. So um, mixed use buildings are buildings that are allowed by site plan review in most of the business districts. Um, site plan review does not require that affordable housing are, is a component. Um, special permits are the uh, sort of gateway to um, requiring affordable units. We do have a number of projects in town that are by special permit, including the project that uh, someone mentioned earlier 408, 408 Northampton Road, the Aspen Heights project. I think that's going to have 11 affordable units. Um, so it's not as if we're not um, building affordable units, but this, you are correct that the mixed use buildings, generally speaking, do not require affordable units as part mm -hmm. of their uh, component. Although I must say that Barry Roberts on University Drive, even though his building is a mixed use building, he was required to um, provide four affordable units there because he did need to get a special permit for a dimensional modification that was not exempt from uh, the requirement for affordable units. So I just wanna keep pursuing this because I guess it's, it's a concern for me that we keep building these additional facilities, apartments, et cetera. But, and I know we're well above the average of, or the, the limit that we need for affordable housing, and yet it still is a need in Amherst. And so um, it's, that's not as much of a financial question, it's really more of a planning department question. 
and many of my other questions are much more around the priority on zoning and those kinds of things, which I totally embrace, as you know, um, and, and looking seriously at our zoning um, stuff as well. Uh, and then the other, and I also just want to applaud the effort, extra efforts on getting grants uh, because they're um, critically important. But one of the things that as we look at the zoning issue is going to be coordinating with ECAC and to the extent that we encourage sustainability in our future permitting and so forth. So mm -hmm. it's just part of that. Thank you. Yeah, um, just to follow up on that, and this will be real quick. Chris, uh, you gave a really good list of grants, and if that's available to just send by email, that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, be happy to. And uh, Kathy. Um, I, I want to follow up on one thing Lynn asked. Um, I don't think we have uh, a requirement for affordable units for any building is I don't think it's not just mixed use so if a large apartment building that wasn't mixed use is that's my understanding we only it only gets triggered by a special permit so would it if it was a large apartment building it would have to do a certain percent depends on where the apartment building is located some some places apartment buildings require a special permit other places they don't require a special permit so if it's if it needs a special permit for the use the basic use then it would be required to include affordable units. If it doesn't need a special permit for the basic use, then it would not, unless it has a dimensional modification that's being requested that um, is over the threshold, and therefore it would be required to provide affordable units. So it's, it's always triggered by the special permit then. Um, it's, not, it's not that mixed use can escape it and a big apartment building can't. It's that anyone who needs it, because then, as you know, some other localities have, as soon as you're over 10 units, uh, it's X percent. It's, it's driven by, it's not with, okay, so I just wanted to make sure I understood it correctly. Then on a totally different topic, you said the flood maps would be coming to us. Um, and I know we're supposed to stick only to financial, but um, do you, can, when they come, can you explicitly tell us whether any of the flood prone conservancy lines that we've drawn, which are different than just old floodplains, whether you've decided to change those. I mean, one of them went through a lawsuit and all of them were triggered by something. Um, but we have this overlay when you look at the maps, which are FPCs. So that's just a request because um, I know I can go back to maps and try to cross map things, but just flag whether you are proposing to change what is in the current books as flood prone conservancy. That would just be very helpful. So that's a, that is a conversation we need to have internally um, to determine what path we're going. They're really two different things. The FEMA flood maps are one thing um, that is a federal government and state government related um, designation. And it also has to do with wetlands regulations. So the Conservation Commission uses those maps when it determines what areas of a property are, are flood prone. Then we have our zoning bylaw, which has flood prone conservancy districts in it. And that is somewhat related to the FEMA maps, but it's not in any way exactly um, mapping the same property. So we have to have that conversation. What are we gonna do with our FPC zone once we adopt the new FEMA maps. And that's something that um, I'm sure that the uh, building commissioner and Dave Zomek and the town manager will all want to um, have that conversation with, you know, together with us in addition to Aaron Jock, the new wetlands administrator. So it's, it's really two separate things, but they are related. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so keeping an eye on the, and realizing how late it's getting, um, I just want to remind the committee uh, that we really need to stick with financial questions and things that belong within other council committees that are really community resources or town services. Uh, we really need to make sure that we don't start going into just anything that interests us, but try and stick with the budget. Uh, 
Dorothy, you had your hand up. Um, a, a question, when somebody has a, builds a mixed use building, does the town receive more money from a mixed use building than from an apartment building? No, the um, town's income for um, a rental property is based on the income that the um, landowner receives from the rental, uh, from the rents. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a, a mixed use building or an apartment building, it's really just based on the income that's um, coming in. That's my understanding. So, I mean, I just, I guess I was interested in um, whether, when the town's needs come into this, I know, uh, you know, is it, does the town need more street rental properties in this age of technical online shopping? Um, or whether that's just totally out of our hands. That's a question I mean, we want to ask the assessor um, to answer because ultimately it's a question of whether the assessor uh, believes that we will have higher level of um, income from mixed use than from pure residential. It's really a matter of supply and demand for anything that goes into the community. If there's a demand for that type of occupancy, there will be a higher rate of return on the income that's derived from the structure. There's three basic elements of how to appraise a building. The income approach of value is one element. The sales approach is the predominant element that drives the force. And then of course the cost approach, which is usually reserved for institutions or unique or new structures. Okay. Sounds very interesting. Not really, <laughs> but thank you for being kind. And it's not simple either. I wish it was, or you wouldn't need me. Dorothy, is there anything else? If not, um, any other questions about uh, planning? No, that that is a topic I'd love to talk about some more at another time. That sounds very interesting. And truthfully, it does sound interesting to me. I'm glad someone finds it interesting. I'm always available to serve you. Lynn's hand is up. Yeah, Lynn. Is Elizabeth going to be joining us for general government? If you need me, I'm here. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I, do, can I just finish on conservation? Uh, yes, I was going to say that I didn't know if you wanted to turn it to conservation, if you want to let other members of your staff go. Um, I can, I can be very brief. I'd rather take questions, frankly, um, recognizing the lateness of the hour. You know, really, I think, you know, on you feel free, obviously, uh, on page 80 and 81 of the budget book, there are long range objectives and our, our status updates for 20 uh, FY20 objectives and, and 21 objectives. Um, you know, I think the two themes, the two takeaway themes that I would share with you for conservation, really, and and sometimes I'm a little understated in what conservation actually does because the functional area, I think, you know, speaks for itself and, and our integrated approach is, is impressive and, and working well. But, you know, our small staff in conservation does a lot out there. There's over 2,000 acres of conservation land. Clearly, this summer and, and summers past, uh, a lot of focus on Puffer Spond. Uh, certainly during COVID, um, Puffer Spond has has taken a higher profile in terms of social distancing. Um, I think uh, from a staffing standpoint, um, the biggest challenge for us really is seasonal staffing. I think overall our staffing levels are, are pretty solid moving forward in the FY21 budget. Um, thanks to creative uh, 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 work of, of Sonia and Sean and, and others. Um, but I, I do think, you know, uh, a vulnerability, I'll give you a vulnerability when the Puffer Spawn 20, uh, when the Puffer Spawn Friends of don't do their fundraiser, like, like in years past, for the last 25 years, they've raised anywhere from five to $10,000 uh, in, in funding. All of that money goes into staffing, porta potties, et cetera. Well, there's likely not going to be any uh, Puffer Spawn uh, uh, breakfast this year, given COVID. So that money just isn't anywhere in the budget. So that's a real vulnerability for taking care of an asset like buffers. I think in general, as I said, our staffing levels are good. Um, I think uh, I'd like to, you know, as we get uh, more clear on our, our capital uh, budgets moving forward, there are some capital uh, items in there, some modest small capital uh, items that support the work we do out on the trails and buffers bond like 
you know, replacing ancient pickup trucks to get staff around and volunteers and, and summer staff around. So looking at those in the fall and beyond is important. The other takeaway theme I would say is that the focus, you know, in the next couple of years clearly is going to be on sustainability. Stephanie Ciccarello does a terrific job. She's working very closely with the ECAC, working on the NVP program, which, which I really think is going to be a game changer. Some of you have participated in some of those workshops, uh, some of them reaching um, uh, communities within Amherst that really have not had a voice. Uh, have not been offered a voice uh, in, in larger public venues, uh, perhaps as long as they've lived here in town. So I think the MVP program is going to be a game changer for us. She's also working, as um, Jeremiah mentioned earlier, um, you know, we got into the Green Communities program right at the outset when it first began. So the, uh, the, the opportunity that that affords us to get state grants to offset some of these efficiency uh, initiatives in places like Munson Library and Town Hall and the, the police department are, are key. So I think the next, you know, one to five years, a lot of it is going to be about sustainability, about making our buildings greener, and about our approaches to climate change and um, resiliency. So I could talk a lot about community gardens and getting people growing more of their own food, etc. That's all part of the background work we do. All of it is important but it's there in the budget book. So I think I'll stop there. If you have any questions, happy to take them. Okay, so I have two things that I'm gonna to touch on that I see this one hand that just went up too. Um, one is that um, just for the committee's awareness, we did have a request from um, ECAC that they would like to meet with the finance committee uh, and this came through both uh, Stephanie Ciccarello and uh, Darcy Demond, our fellow counselor, uh, on behalf of ECAC, um, because it really relates to what they would like to see into the future, and they recognize that it's not an FY21 budget issue, but they want us to start thinking um, beyond FY21 and what their needs are. Um, it was sort of agreed that they would meet with, uh, have a meeting with us, but it would be after we're done with the budget process to the date that we can arrange with them. And uh, so that's, uh, I don't think there's anything more to say on that subject. Um, the one thing that I was going to ask Dave, uh, the uh, long range objectives bullet four was to complete the purchase of agricultural preservation restrictions over the remaining unprotected farmland and the preservation of critical remaining open space. Um, is that, I don't know if that's a conversation that you've had with any other council committees. From a pure finance point of view, and uh, a member of the old finance committee used to drive this issue on a regular basis, uh, when that decision is made uh, to not develop a piece of land for other than farm purposes and to keep it in agriculture, it obviously has a benefit to the community, but it has a cost to the community because development doesn't take place and the revenue that comes with the development doesn't take place. And so from a finance committee point of view, to the extent that we look at revenue, there's another side to it um, and that um, it's a conversation that ought to be had from time to time. And the same thing about acquisition of additional conservation areas. I think that uh, that same former member of the uh, um, committee raised it in that regard too. Um, so I just wanted to point that out and see if Dave has any comments on it. Yeah, it's a it's a longer conversation perhaps than this late in your 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 meeting, and and happy to have it. Um, yeah, there's a lot of elements to that. I mean, the the first thing I would point out is is that. Um, at least with APRs, the decision to, 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 to uh, move forward with an APR is really in the hands of the uh, private owner of the property. Um, the town actually doesn't really have to participate in an APR financially to make it happen. So uh, a landowner can partner with the state 
and do an APR without the towns. We don't have any say in whether a, a private landowner APRs their property or not. We have chosen through the years to participate financially in those and and uh, you know that's been a decision of, of uh, former uh, members of the CONCOM and select board and town meeting. But I, I think you know you've heard me say that and I really do believe our, our, our program of acquisition of open space and APRs is really slowing down. You, you may not have the 15 year perspective that I have, but if you look at the data, it really does show that we are not acquiring what we did in the 80s, 90s, or early 2000s. So we've had a, a little bit of a pulse here, uh, and we're still uh, hoping uh, with, with Hickory Ridge, that is an open space project, not an agricultural preservation uh, project, but, but there are still some uh, properties in Amherst with prime soils. And I think they'll come up from time to time. Um, I think of one in particular, uh, if you look off of Southeast Street, if any of you uh, ever visit Andrew's Greenhouse, uh, all of the acres that uh, are behind Andrew's Greenhouse are not permanently protected. Should they be? I think that's a conversation to have at some point. I know that uh, the owners have expressed interest in, in preserving those at some point. So I think that conversation will come. I will say that right now, um, we don't have any new uh, open space projects that are on the near term horizon. So um, I think there will be a little time to uh, catch our breath here a little bit. Um, we are going to try to for move forward with Hickory Ridge as has been voted. Um, and we'll see if, if that moves to, uh, to closing, which, which I think it will later this summer. Um, but I think there are a lot of decisions. I will say also that all of the land, as far as I know, all of the land that is that could be APR'd is currently in the Chapter 61A program. So even though it's not permanently protected, if the, the owners of that land keep their land in 61A, the town is not seeing any additional revenue uh, and won't unless that land is taken out of chapter. So, um, so anyway, I think it's a longer term uh, discussion and, and we'll have it over the next, you know, two to five years. Um, so, you know, um, I'll stop there. I, did I, also I, I agree. You just uh, primed it by including it in the long range objectives, but um, I don't want to take it any further. I did want to mention, I, I kind of uh, uh, skipped right over our solar project at the landfill. It is really going to happen. Stephanie Ciccarello and others have been working very hard on it. Uh, we're looking at a, a fall uh, tw uh, 2021 uh, groundbreaking out at the the North Landfill. It's a complex project that involves mitigation for lost habitat, as you know. That habitat will be preserved on the new, uh, excuse me, the, the uh, younger landfill on the south side of Route 9. Uh, we're working with the Kestrel Trust and the state on a conservation restriction for that that is required to do the solar. So there's a lot of moving parts, but I'm, I'm quite confident it's going to happen. It's received all of its local and state permits. So we're, 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 we're ready to go and we're, we'll uh, keep working with our solar developer there. Okay. Other questions? Looking for any additional questions about uh, conservation. If not, we should let, every, let our staff get on to other things in their lives and appreciate their being here and just very quickly conclude our own business as a committee. Uh, Lynn. And I want to make sure that we check in with the Finance Committee um, with the possibility of just understanding people's schedules next week before we close. Did you have something specific in mind? Uh, well, first of all, uh, if we could start at 1.30 on Tuesday, um, that might help. Uh, I also wonder if we should go ahead and be scheduling yet another meeting either on Wednesday or Thursday next week, because we still have general government to do and we still have our report to do. Yeah, and I was going to uh, just briefly touch on the report process because um, we, you know, I, I worked with Mary Lou really hard to get her model out there. We want to start getting the sections put together and I need to write the initial section 
And I will say that the initial section is not going to be particularly long because I think that our two sets of guidelines, the original guidelines and the amended guidelines, um, speak a lot to where we are and they have been approved by the council. So it's going to be um, some by reference to that document. Uh, and the other thing is just to clarify any questions about process for consideration of the budget so that those, um, and, and I think that that will be the focus that I'll try and work on on the introductory section. And uh, what I'm hoping for is that each of us will work on our own areas. I have uh, the ones that we just discussed this last few minutes were my areas um, and try and come up with something that is about what Mary Lou did and or even a little bit shorter, but touches on those main points and uh, that we get the drafts and then um, we need to have the drafts in order to look at them to see if they contain the content that is approved by the committee. Because if there's um, people are making uh, observations or recommendations that the committee doesn't approve of, they should not go in our report. Um, so, Kathy. Um, I just want to second Lynn's proposal that we meet an hour earlier next week. I think that would be really helpful. And Andy, you had told us, um, you know, target times to get things in to you, but I think if we finished areas, it would really be good to try to get drafts um, by next Tuesday or Wednesday. I mean, you know, I've got I've got an easy one in library because it's going to be short, and then Bob Bob and I can figure out whether we just write them separately and combine them later. But if if we want to look at a set of them, um, waiting until a lot later, so at least you could look at a set of them and say, do you have? six people's different writing styles <laughs> and a huge amount of content and are you just going to ha have to be the master editor and bring it together in a report because group writing a report sometimes is very difficult so i just allowing that ex i think we do need the extra meeting so i don't know when um you know my schedule is wide open next week so uh, so why don't I think that we're, uh, Lynn and I are going to meet possibly with Athena tomorrow. And uh, yeah. then we will send out uh, either a doodle poll or some other, or just by email poll to see about availability for an additional meeting if we think that that's the appropriate step to take. Um, I agree with what uh, yeah. you said, Kathy. Uh, and I know, Elizabeth, you had said you want to. There's a conflict. Uh, the Board of Assessors is meeting at 11 a.m. on the 15th. I believe that's the date you're talking, Wednesday the 15th? No, we're so talking the 14th. It, so uh, Tuesday the 14th? Paul, uh, uh, Andy, I think we need to at least settle on whether or not the committee is willing to meet at 1.30 on uh, Tuesday because we need to post the meeting, the change in the meeting time. And then we can deal with uh, a quick doodle poll for other options on Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday. Okay. Um, I, I need to know what you would, we, I have scheduled next week. I started going, scheduling appointments with doctors that I'd put off for many months. And so on Tuesday, I can come, I will be going to Connecticut to a doctor. We can get, I can be back by 2.30 can't tell I'd be back by 1.30. So, you know, that doesn't mean that you don't have a meeting. My question is, what are you going to be doing on the Tuesday meeting? We haven't done general government at all. Right. Whole another section of the budget. But if I weren't there, you could still do it. Um, yes. On Thursday, I have made an appointment that starts at 1.45. And I have another appointment at 4. So, you know, it just... General government on Tuesday and Thursday, because if we're going to be talking about the report or analyzing the report, I should be there. But um, I'm just going to say I have problems because that was a week I thought, okay, now I can make appointments for doctors and things. 
What about other members of the committee as far as Tuesday, 1.30? I can do Tuesday at 1.30, Pat. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm, my, good. My, I'm, I'm free all week. So getting back to general government to make sure that if there's anything else we need from Elizabeth then can cover her time. Tuesday is, is fine. The only, the only interruption I have is, is Wednesday at 11. Someone had mentioned Wednesday as an option. And uh, that we do have a conflict. We have an 11 a.m. Uh, Board of Assessors meeting. Okay, but uh, that's Wednesday, the fifteenth. Yeah, when, uh, but we'll if we'll do general services on Tuesday. Tuesday? Okay, we'll Tuesday is fine. Tuesday's wide open. When you're talking one o'clock, correct? And Dorothy's the one who has a conflict there, and um, I'll check with Dorothy. You can't get there for a one thirty meeting, probably, but it could come for later. So. Dorothy, where you're muted, so we're not hearing with you. That's what she said. I said we have to. I have to. We have to go together because of the driving to share the driving, and it's it's really a skin appointment for my husband. But it's possible I could be back. I can't tell. It depends upon how quickly it goes at the doctor's office. Okay, but you'll join us as soon as you can. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'd right, sure I'd be sure to by two twelve thirty, two thirty. So we'll have to, as uh, you pointed out, that we need to get that reposted. Uh, so we'll we'll repost the meeting for Tuesday for 1.30. And um, I'm going to send out a, a, a poll about Wednesday. Anything else? Yeah, Andy, I, did we ever get the written responses to the questions on um, right. Public ahead. Works? Yes, and I think we'll, um, Sean has them, and I'll uh, one of us will get them out to you. Great. Another, we'll send out some more questions that we received today from Lynn. Some of them, some of them were asked, some of them weren't, but we'll send out another batch of questions and answers um, today. Uh, Sean, did you already send the answers to Andy? So does he have them? Yeah, yeah. Andy has. Um, a, uh, I sent him two packets, but the final packet, Andy, has all of the questions answered plus the vehicle listing. Okay. Great. Yeah, it's just too many moving parts at the same time. And, uh, That's fine. <laughs> uh, I will get them, all, uh, get them along. And uh, I can't think of anything else that we absolutely need to do at this point in time. Um, can I just work. ask on those, can we also post them in the packet? Because um, one of the counselors who was participating last week said she wanted to see the, so just when we get it, you know, post it in the packet for next week so people always can find it. So, Andy, you send it to us, but I was just thinking that other people can get those as well. It would be great. Unless there's a reason not to. Um, let's take a look at them. I think there should be no problem. Okay. No, just, Mandy Jo said she'd love to see answers to some of them. So she was, it, I mean, we can always just, send them she and george both. Her and probably it's more certain to get to there but it probably should be posted too because they are public documents and right. therefore they should go and uh i will send along the thing explaining uh the anti-aid amendment um and uh then people who have questions about it can ask questions later but i think it's pretty well self-explanatory once you if you spend time looking at it so i'll get that out I think, just, just, I think just to make it easier, um, I think Sean can, is, all of our answers are coming through Sean, so he can just package up all the Q and A's and put the, and get those posted for you. Great. Okay. And just so everybody knows, um, and I can send this out to people as to what we, re, what was requested. There ended up being three additional questions, uh, for the chief of police and, uh, they came from three different members of the committee, one each, and uh, I will get them along uh, to the committee so that you know what else was asked. And, and remember, we have on Monday, and there may be um, additional discussion from that. Yes. Um, 
So I think that the questions were pretty well focused on FY21 and we're not, uh, they may help the Monday discussion, but they're by uh -oh. 21 budget. Rose. So I think freezing means it might be time to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> it's the machine telling us. Okay. So we, uh, much later than we would like, we are adjourned at 545. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat>